Now we're ready. All right. Good evening and welcome to the November 3rd, 2021 uh, meeting of the Lower Makefield Board of Supervisors. Uh, with that, uh, Kurt, do you want to give the opening Zoom preamble? Sure. We are here at the Township Building at 1100 Edgewood Road. For those who still might be interested in showing up, uh, but if not, you can dial 646 558 585. I'm sorry, 646 558. 8656 and our meeting ID number 230-936-1902 pound when prompted. This is also on uh, our agenda on the website. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, I would ask that everyone rise and join with me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Uh, Fred, are you here? I'm here. Supervisor Lewis and uh, Supervisor Elect Lewis, are you here? Yes. Congratulations to you, sir. Thank you. Dan, are you here? I am here. Thank you. And James? I am here, yes. Welcome. Then we have a full house. Public comment on agenda items will be taken as each agenda item is discussed. And with that, we are along to agenda item number four. COVID-19 update. Kurt, is there any update? I do not have an update this evening. Okay. Any questions from the supervisors? Public comment. Moving on to agenda item number five, community announcements. During this portion of the agenda, as a reminder, residents and youth organizations may call in to make a special announcement or can contact the township at admin at lmt.org to request a special announcement be added to the agenda. Parks and recreation, in-person recreation opportunities like sunset yoga, goat yoga, and art Zumba are, and more are now available. Information can be found on our website, lmt.org, under our recreation department. Electronic recycling day at the St. John Evangelist Church, 752 Big Oak Road, is for this Saturday, November 6th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. The Veterans Day Parade is this Saturday, November 6th on Edgewood Road. Interested sponsors and participate, participants can still contact Kathy H at lmt.org or call our recreation department. That's all I have. Um, with that, I would like to add to and, and reminder to um, all of our volunteer groups out there, if, if you'd like to have something to agenda, Put on the agenda, please just send it an email. But I do note that the Lutheran Church of God's Love, located at 791 Newtown Yardley Road, is collecting blankets for the homeless. Um, they urge you to clean out your closets and drop them off. So uh, that's 79 Newtown Yardley Road. Also, our very own police department, in partnership with the Lions Club, is collecting toys for the family services of Bucks County. I believe those toys can be dropped off here. Chief, correct? So, uh, you know, feel free to feel There's free a to bring off spot in our lobby of the police department, 1100 Edgewood Road. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Then with that, any other supervisors have anything? Yes, Dan. Yes. Oh, sure. Um, I, I guess I'll, uh, I'll say congratulations to supervisor Lewis for, for his, uh, hard fought victory yesterday. I thought, uh, he and his opponent both, both were, uh, very professional in how they ran things. Um, Interestingly enough, I can't let it. That he may, I believe, he set a record for most most votes by a uh, LMT supervisor, but and I so it doesn't go to his head. He was well behind our uh, our tax collector, so he needs to step up his game a little bit. So, I got to amp up my candy game. There you go. But congratulations, John. Thanks. Anything else? Okay, then with that, uh, we're on to agenda item number six, consider approval of the minutes for October 20th, 2021. Is there a motion? 
So moved. Second. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, John. Any discussion? Any public comment? No public comment. Okay. No public comment. Uh, with that, I'll call the question. All in favor, please signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. 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 Great. Motion passes 5 0. Agenda item number seven. Do we have uh, Fred on the line? Yes, Fred's in the room now. Thank you so much. Hi, Fred. Hey, hi. How's everyone doing? Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right. Hopefully, we'll have a relatively quick uh, but very informative update on all of our sewer projects. Um, the first update is on contract SWR 21-1. This is the Lower Makefield Township Mayhole Lighting pro uh, Project. Um, the contractor has started work, but unfortunately has had some mechanical breakdowns and due to the supply chain took some delays in getting the uh, replacement parts. He has, however, uh, come back and started work the end of this week to complete it. There are no anticipated change orders on this job and he's actually doing a very good job and um, we're finding a lot of leaks and a lot of structural repairs that were required that he's been able to do. Next item. Is contract SWR 21-2. This is Suzanne, the, can we ask about e each of them? Before, oh, sorry, so he doesn't, absolutely. I don't want you to, if we can no, ask. No, sorry, you. I don't want to, I knew you had a long meeting, so I wanted, didn't want to delay, I, but absolutely. Did, no, uh, you, ahead, you said, I'm, I'm sorry, Suzanne. No, no, you said ahead. something that was music to my ears, no change orders anticipated. Um, does it look like we're pretty much on, on budget, under budget on this uh, one? Exactly or? on budget. All right, okay. That's yep. all I wanted to know. Thank you for yep. saying that. On this one. Okay, next, go ahead. Next yep. item is contract SWR 21-2. This is the sanitary sewer lining project in the Neshaminy Basin. Um, we picked an area with very high flows um, and we were not able to televise it uh, prior to bypass pumping and awarding of the contract. Um, so uh, as we did that, we found there was approximately 1,438 feet of pipe that was completely underwater that was previously lined. Um, so what we did was we authorized or uh, requested a change order to find an equal amount of line, which we were able to do um, and line that to keep everything within the contract price. However, there is a change order in the amount of $6,600 for the additional uh, televising to identify an upstream area. Because the flows were so high here and it was previously lined, we moved upstream to find that where those leaks were coming from and we were able to identify that. This change order was recommended by the members of the sewer authority who were at the meeting last week. We did not have a quorum so it's not an official recommendation, but it is the recommendation of the members present. Um, so there will be, the only change order for this job will be for this additional amount of televising. And this was done now because the contractor was able to do it utilizing their bypass pumping. If we had tried to do this prior to construction, it would have cost us approximately $35,000 in bypass pumping. So, uh, we decided to wait until the contract was on site to do this. So Fred, the amount that you'd like approved is $6,600, is that correct? That is correct. I'll make a motion to consider change order number one of contract SWR 21-2 for $6,600. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, James. Any discussion? Any public comment? All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. 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 Dan, are you an aye or are you a nay? I'm, I'm a nay on this. You're a nay? I'm a nay. Okay, thank you. So the motion passes four to one. So. Okay, next item is a contract SWR 21-3. This is for the sanitary sewer lining in the uh, Marsville service area. Um, and, and here we ran into the same thing due to high flows. 
we were able to identify approximately 8,000 and, or excuse me, 840 linear feet of sanitary sewer line that was previously uh, lined. So we worked our way upstream uh, and televised to find an approximately the same amount, it was slightly less linear footage, um, which will be a reduction in the overall contract price uh, when we receive their payment request. But we did have to pay for that televising. That televising, once again, was a price of $6,600. The sewer authority uh, reviewed this. And once again, the recommendation of the members there were to pay this change order because it did identify significant additional um, sanitary sewer lines that could be lined and remaining under the contract price. Make a motion to approve change order number one of contract SWR 21-3 for $6,600. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, James. Any discussion? Go ahead, Dan. Yeah. Fred, what would, um, what would keep us from having, since we're handing this over to Aqua and they're going to take on all of our assets, why would we go ahead and do additional work with, rather than having Aqua do it? Because we're required by our corrective action plan. Uh, our corrective action plan is what allows us to have connections released under the, uh, or excuse me, our corrective, under the connection management plan. So we have a requirement uh, that was placed on us by the PADP that we committed to, that we would uh, spend a certain amount of money and address these things. And in exchange with our, for our compliance with this, they will continue to release connections through the connection management plan. It is the compliance with this is how we were able to obtain the capacity for the Pricker Preserve project, which was just recently received their planning module approval. That planning module approval would not have been able to be granted nor would any other connections to any other proposed developments in Lower Makefield if we do not comply with this plan. So we have an obligation with the DEP uh, to comply with this. So I'm, I'm curious, because we've spoken before when, when the back early, like late April of 2020, right? And when we spoke then, we were looking at, I had, we, I had asked you, then about what was this, I was asking about the status of certain RFPs that we were looking for because it was getting it to be the end of April in the construction season and we wanted to wanted to get things going, right? And so we just, you know, we were anxious about that. And at, at that time, you know, that's when it, we were still discussing the sale, but it looked like it was going to go through. And, you know, when, when we spoke, it's it seemed like you, your your opinion was why would you go forward with all these projects and spend all this money if you're just going to sell the system? Um, and you know we we raise rates a lot. We spend a lot of money on this on that on those items, um, and we continue to spend money on those items and do more work. So I um, doesn't quite they, they don't quite mix um, or add up. No, I don't want to say add up. That's not a nice way to say it. Um, they just don't quite match what what we discussed back in April of 2020? Well, the difference between April of 2020 to now is we still own the system. As long as we still own the system, it's based on a calendar year. And we're gonna own the system, in my opinion, until the end of this calendar year. Therefore, we have an obligation under DEP uh, that we agreed to, that we have to do this. So my opinion, it will change as soon as, like if next year, if we go to closing, April, or not April, January of 2022. I would not recommend, and I have not gone forward to make a recommendation to you to perform any work in 2022. But because we own it in 2021, we are we are responsible to the DEP and they could take you know action against us, not only in terms of not releasing of EDUs, but for not complying with our requirements and our commitments. So that's what changed most likely if you were to look back, and I don't remember exactly the conversation, but if someone would have told me in 2020, in April of 2020, that we wouldn't be closed here, I, I, I wouldn't have anticipated that. As things have, have uh, played out and the process has gone along, you know, obviously our responsibilities and our requirements have extended uh, until the point of the sale and the transfer of the asset. So as long as, I, as, long as you're responsible for the system, I have to tell you, you have to comply with your requirements of ownership. Okay. 
Any other discussion? Any public comment? With that, I call the question. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye, raising your hand. Aye. 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 All those opposed? Opposed. Okay. Motion passes 3 2 with John and Dan in dissent. Okay, next. Next item is contract SWR 20 4D. This is a Stackhouse pump station. This is actually a 2020 project that has been considerably delayed uh, and continues to be delayed due to uh, the ability to have all the material supply. Um, the mechanical, structural, and site work is all complete on this. The building is all there. We're waiting for three items to complete and make this pump station operational. The first one is the emergency generator has been delayed and continues to be delayed uh, because it, quite honestly, things that we had ordered got, that were uh, we expected to be delivered got taken out for emergency jobs due to all the flooding. Uh, equipment suppliers have an obligation. If someone has a existing facility that the kit that is uh, in violation of uh, Clean Water Acts to provide them with any available materials. Um, so our one of our generator that we had ordered was taken under that thing. So we've been delayed and are waiting for that generator to be delivered in December, a replacement generator. We're also waiting for the final Pico power connection and the public water. Uh, we're trying to tie those all in at the same time so we can do startup with this pump station. Um, on this one, I actually have three change orders that have gone back over you know, a period of time and um, then two payment requests. The first one is change order number one, which is for additional clear uh, tree clearing. Um, since we, we started the contract or, or awarded the contract and had identified it, there were significant storms that came through here and damaged trees that were on township land that came down on this property and in our easement that had to be removed. Um, there were also adjoining trees that were within our easement that were not originally planned to be taken out, but due to either damage to them from other trees falling on them or just a concern that they would eventually die, we elected to have those trees removed. What, the reason for this is that this area is behind a residential house that is hemmed in on uh, one side by basically retaining walls and no access. The other side, we are basically preventing easy access through the construction of the pump station. So right now there's one way access in. So an abundance of caution because it would be extremely expensive if a tree were to die that we would have, a you know, that caused by our contractor or our project to bring a crane in later on. So this actually required a crane to bring these trees in. The change order was in the amount of $9,740. It also required some additional safety fence uh, to be extended around the work area so that it could be done safely in their backyard. That was an agreement that we had with the property owners that any work that we did would be inside of a safety fence. Uh, this change order was recommended by the members and attendance at the sewer authority meeting. Um, and I would look, look for the board's consideration uh, for approval of this change order. Well, I'll make a motion to approve change order number one, the amount of, of uh, contract SWR 20-4D and the amount of $9,740. I think 50 cents too. Is it 50, 50 cents, Fred? Yes, at 50 cents. And, oh, excuse me, in the amount of $9,740 and 50 cents. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, James. Any discussion? Yeah. Yes, <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. Um, I see the address. Where Where along the property were the were the trees, Fred? Were they in the? And the re the reason I ask is purely to cover ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. This area is within the part of the properties within the floodplain of the Delaware Canal, so it's mm -hmm. it's up next to the canal. Yeah. And we have state regulations for removal of trees within a floodway. So yeah. I just want to make sure that we are we covered that and we didn't accidentally remove them without getting proper permits and stuff. No, they were on the up street or on the uphill side of that. And two of the trees actually came down. 
So they were actually the removal of a down tree okay. uh, that went in there. The other one was on the upstream. So if you're familiar with the property, it's between the two properties. There's a, a shed out there. It was adjacent to that shed where the guy has the, the uh, fenced in yard for his dog. I got you. Good. Thanks. Yes. Any public comment? If that, I'll call the question. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. 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 James, were you an aye? <coughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you. If the motion passes 5 0. Oh, thank you, John. The next item is a second change order on this project. This is for the force main connection. <laughs> because it is isolated and there's no access back in there, uh, the contractor agreed to work with us. And he recommended, uh, and we agreed, to install additional isolation valves so that way we can isolate a portion of that force main and not have to access into the backyard. So this is a change order for the materials only. The contractor agreed to install them uh, uh, for free. Why did the contractor do that? Contractor did that so that he could clearly test and identify everything that would, all the pipes that were installed between uh, where there was going to be no more access. But there is a long-term advantage for Aqua uh, if, if we sell it, but also the homeowners that this is the only way to isolate and bypass pump this and allow for any other uh, repairs to be done in the future without having to take down significant other trees or transverse a uh, uh, rock uh, retaining walls. Uh, this change order is in the amount of $5,750. Once again, it's for material only, and it's the actual invoice cost only of the materials. Um, the sewer authority recommended this for the long-term operation and maintenance of this pump station. So I will look for consideration by the Board of Supervisors. So moved. <coughs> Excuse me. Second. Motion by Dan, second by uh, John in the amount of $5,750. Um, just to clarify, Fred, because I thought I was following you and then I don't know if I got lost. But you, you're saying it's for materials only because the rest of the work associated was given to us by the contractor for gratis. So it's not that we're anticipating more changes. This is all no. it's going to take. It's all it's going to take. No. Okay. Thank you for that. Any other supervisors have any questions? Any public comment? With that, I'll call the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. 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 Excellent. Motion passes 5-0. The last change order on this job is change order number three. Uh, it is for an unmarked storm drain, which basically takes, it's a privately owned uh, storm drain, which takes water, um, basically it runs off the road and through this that they have buried over the years. Because it's private, it was unmarked. The property owners weren't even aware of it. But we did televise it once we came across it to make sure that it was connected uh, to the, uh, uh, you know, and was conveying stormwater basically across, instead of going sheet flowing across their yard, it went down through uh, and discharged into the um, um, side of the canal. Um, this is only for the replacement of the line that we had to remove to install our gravity um, uh, force main, or excuse me, gravity center, sewer main, and the force main. So we basically had to cut about 10 feet of the pipe out. But it did cause us delays, and we wanted, before we replaced that pipe, we wanted to make sure that it was active. Um, so there was a certain amount of time that was done there. Um, you know, the contractor knew of other private utilities, such as our sprinkler system, that we all knew about. This, the property owners did not know about, we did not know about. Um, so that change order is in the amount of $2,179.25. Um, this was reviewed by the sewer authority members present and was recommended uh, for approval. Is there a motion? Make a motion to approve change order number three, the unmarked storm drain for the Stackhouse pump station, the amount of $2,179.25. Second. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, John. Any discussion? Any public comment? All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye and raising your hands. 
Aye. Aye. Excellent. Passes 5 0. Next item is consideration of payment request number one for the Stackhouse Pump Station upgrade. Uh, this is for work that was completed until September 10th of 2021, a very long period of time. The total amount of the contract, uh, including the change orders that were approved, is $645,240. This change order, or excuse me, this change order, this payment request is in the amount of $391,417.17. Um, and the amount remaining on the contract if this, if this payment request is approved, is $253,822.90. The uh, sewer authority members that were present reviewed this and recommended payment uh, in the amount of $391,417.10 for payment request number one. Your motion. So moved. Thank you, James. Second. Second? second, if you need. I heard Fred first, Dan. That's okay. I, I didn't okay. see anyone. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? Yeah. Yes, go ahead, Dan. Fred, I'm looking. I, obviously, payment requests one and two are, re are related in that they're part of the same overall budget, right? Um, I think I'm, I just want to look at it in, uh, from an overall perspective. Um, we 200 something. I have the second one open. So after all said and done with these two payment requests, it's 107,000 and change would be left. Is do these two, do these two finish off the project or is there still more to do? No, there's still, there is still $107,000 to do. The $107,000 okay. is basically for the installation of the emergency generator is, is the main amount um, uh, that, 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 is outstanding and that's in the order of um i don't have it right here in front of me but um 32,000. so we actually the at the sewer authority meeting we extensively went over this uh the remix payment request number two to make sure that it was more than sufficient monies there to complete all the work and the, and there clearly is okay that 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 i just want to get a big picture of all of mm -hmm. them as yep. we go through so thank you that's, I'm good, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, public comment? No public comment. If that would call the question. All in favor, please signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. 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 Motion passes 5 0. Last but not least, Fred. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's payment request number two. This is for the, the uh, construction of the control building. The wiring inside the installation of the pumps, uh, uh, wiring the pumps and controls, um, and then the generator pad, the driveway, site work, seating. Uh, we pushed to get its it um, uh, site work completed right now. While instead of allowing him, the contractor originally wanted to wait for the generator to be delivered, build the building around that, and finish up the site work. I'm obviously was obviously concerned, being that this was um, in September, uh, work completed in October that A, it will be stabilized this year, and that all the paving would be done this year. So that way I wouldn't have a pump station that I wouldn't have access to to plow snow and things like that once a generator comes in. Uh, concern being generator comes in mid-December, I can't pave, I have no access, I started a pump station. So we pushed him very hard to get all of this work done so that literally when the generator and power arrive, this pump station will be made you know, active immediately. Um, this con this um, payment request is in the amount of $121,411.19. There will be um, $107,600 remaining on this contract. The members of the sewer authority um, recommended payment of this. And uh, as I said before, they made sure that there was sufficient monies left to complete the job with no additional change orders. And they also appreciate the fact that all the site work is done, the grass is growing, restoration is there, not only for the adjoining homeowners, but just for the environment to make sure everything is stabilized this construction season. Thank you. Is there a motion? Make a motion a move. to approve uh, request Fred. number one or two for $121,411.19. Second. Second. Thank you, Dan. Any discussion? 
Any public comment? Up, oh, we have public comment. <clears throat> Sir, please state your full name and address for the record. Lee Pedowitz, 247 Truman Way, Yardley. Lee, can you step up? The mic is on, but if you come a little bit closer, thank you. <clears throat> How's this? Good. Would you entertain just a comment on this entire section seven? Surely. Hey, what, just observing it, it seems like there are a lot of contingencies, such as this additional televising, the tree clearing, that probably were not included in the additional contract. And my comment is, I would think if you had a contract that there would be some what if clause to take this into account. That is it. Oh, congr congratulations to Supervisor Willis. Thank that you. That is it. Thank you, Mr. Pedowitz. Yeah. Suzanne, if I can respond to Mr. Pedowitz sure, real quick. Sure, go ahead, Dan. Because I've sat with Mr. Ebert on some of these in years past when I was the sewer authority liaison, and I'm sure Fred's probably seen the same thing. Um, there is some level of, of contingency built into all these contracts. I mean, we don't go out and balloon them for the sake of ballooning them, but there is, you, you always, whenever you write these contracts, do put in some level of contingency. Uh, but when you're looking at, what was that first one from? Mr. Ebert, 1,400 plus feet of pipe underwater. Yes. That's 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 not normal, <laughs> you know. So that those are when they're out of the norm. That's that's where the change orders come in. I, I understand what Mr. Pedowitz is saying, but I do think um, historically that's that's how we've tried to do things uh, with our contracts. So I, I I appreciate the comment, but um, I, I think that is something that we have tried to do in the past. So I just wanted to make sure that he was aware of that because he got, he does ask good questions like that on on many topics in the township. Yeah, I, I uh, thank you, and I you know I just want to remind everybody we are literally talking about sewage, and we are doing the best to fix all that. So uh, if it turns out that the pipes are a little bit more eroded than it turns out we believe they were because of the years of not dealing with it. I think it makes sense to go ahead and fix it as best we can. So thank you for that question. Is there any other public comment? Okay, so with that, uh, we are done. Thank you, Fred, for your time this evening. Thank you, guys. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. <clears throat> Suzanne, oh, okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. Don't go. I'm on. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Uh, with that, I'll call the question. All those in favor, please signify oh, by yeah. saying aye and raising your hands. <laughs> aye. 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 Thank you. Motion passes 5 0. Now, can, now can Fred leave? Oh. Okay. <laughs> Suzanne, can I ask a quick question? Of uh, me or Fred? This, it, uh, actually, it's of Kurt to see if it applies to Fred, to be honest. Um, it's part, I think, Kurt, as part of our budget discussion tonight, do we have to discuss the the sewer rates for 2022, or are we going to do that late, like on the 17th or something? Well, that would, I mean, you can discuss it as I had outlined in my budget presentation, we would have to pass the rates um, because we'd be carrying over essentially a billing time frame that would go into 2022 that would require us to um, carry those rates over or, or pass rates so they would carry over, correct? Okay. Is Mr. Ebert... If he's leave, obviously he's not giving a presentation with respect to that, that's going to be you doing that later if, if as part Correct. of your presentation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, Fred. Uh, All right. Okay. See you guys. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Andy, your turn. Agenda item number eight. Yes, hi, supervisors. You have within your packet my engineer's report. I have no new updates uh, from the that report, and thus I would. Uh, like to jump into the agenda item that I have. Um, agenda item A is to consider payment certificate number three, which is the final payment certificate for the 2021 road program to Harris Black Topping Inc. in the amount of $19,755.35. Uh, this is to complete the 2021 road program. Uh, they had some punch list items where they had to restore uh, some grass areas around the ADA ramps that were installed. Uh, they completed that work. Uh, they have provided a two-year maintenance bond uh, that is, uh, will expire in uh, late October of 2023. Uh, the, the project on, a whole, on the whole was a success. 
It came in approximately $6,600 under budget. Um, so uh, that's to summarize the, the project on the whole. Once this payment certificate is approved and payment is made to the contractor, we can uh, close out our liquid fuels um, reimbursement application with PennDOT. Thus, uh, we're recommending payment to Harris Black Topping Inc. in the amount of $19,755.35. Move. Move. Thank you, Fred. Second. Second. To Dan. Any discussion? Go ahead, Dan. Andy, real usual question, I guess. How do we do versus uh, actual versus budget uh, for the overall road program? Uh, it it was six thousand six hundred dollars under budget. So right on. So sixty six hundred is a big. It's, it's third it, or fourth time we hear that number tonight. Well, it it, it was uh, yeah. That's about one percent of the project. Um, it yeah. would have been less. Uh, except for the price of asphalt had right. has gone up significantly. Um, there was about $17,000 worth of a, a difference in the price of asphalt from when they placed it versus when it was bid. And thus we had by obligation through PennDOT requirements, uh, we had to pay an additional amount uh, for the price of, for the increased price of the asphalt. But um, overall, yeah, it, it, we, we still came in under budget. And it, I'm, I'm anticipating Mr. Pedowitz, uh, it, uh, Mr. Pedowitz type question, because as you saw him, um, based on everything you've seen across the, across the board with the program, all the paving looks, looks like it was done well, uh, past inspection, all that, all that stuff. Yes, it did pass inspection. In fact, we uh, checked all of the roads after we uh, experienced the hurricane and um, back in the early September and um, experienced some difficulty or some damage to other recently paved sections of the roadway within the township uh, on a different project. And so we went and inspected all the roads that were paved during the 2021 road program and uh, found no damage there. And so, uh, yeah, uh, we've inspected it. And Excellent, thanks Shane. Any other questions, discussion? Any public comment? We have public comment. Please state your full name and address for the record. Step close to the mic. I know. Lee Pedowitz, 247 Truman Way Yard. Lee. Uh, Dan almost hit it on the head. In light of the inferior quality of the paving job that was done in the Regency development, I was just wondering if there's a guarantee. Does Harris give us any guarantee? I think. Uh, uh, Andy told me there's 18 months after, well, just in the Yardley year, in uh, the Regency development, there's an 18 month period after it's turned over to us from toll. Is there any type of guarantee for the paving that was done throughout the township? Yes. And what is that? 18 yeah. months. 18 months. So it's, when a, it's that... actually a two year maintenance bond. Two that we sorry. It, it, would, it, would be, it would start when the paving is completed and signed off by the engineer. Okay, so has that been done yet or no? Yes, we, we, have, uh, we have in our, hand, in our possession a two-year maintenance bond that would expire uh, in October, late October 2023. Okay, is that what you mentioned before? It was, it was hard to hear you. Yes, sorry. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? With that, I will remember to call the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. 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 Excellent. Motion carries 5-0. Uh, before we move on to the next one, can I ask uh, the township engineer a quick question? Surely. So, uh, Andy, on the Morazzo townhomes, they've been in the same state for a while. I know you inspected the utility work or, uh, and looked at the grading plans. Do you know why there's been a delay with that project or where it stands? Uh, yes, it's my understanding that um, the developer is having material, uh, uh, is having difficulty obtaining some, in, some of the material for the homes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and thus they are looking at uh, adjusting some of the material that is being provided for the homes um, and Therefore, uh, that's what the delay has been on construction of the actual homes. 
Um, a lot of the site infrastructure is, has been installed, but um, yeah, there's been a delay on the homes. And uh, so uh, I, I do believe that uh, the developer has indicated that they will be starting within the next couple of weeks um, on the homes themselves. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Sure. Uh, then we are on to agenda item number nine, project updates. I don't, if there's a specific question, I'll do my best, but uh, nothing at this point that I need to discuss. If there are any questions from the board, any public comment? Hearing none, we'll move along to agenda item number 10, the police ratifications. Uh, yes, on this item, I would ask the board to ratify a previous vote um, uh, that was before the board at our last public meeting. And uh, these items are the promotion of Colin McTamany to police corporal, the restructure and promotions of command staff and further of state and national police reform initiatives, and the hiring of Kevin Riley, Jevin Downs, and Brendan Montemorano. Uh, you need separate motions on each one? I think it's uh, probably best, yeah. I think the minutes should reflect uh, each one of those, yeah. So I would say. I, okay. I was going to move that uh, the board ratify the promotion of Mr. Colin McCamney to police corporal and ratify its prior vote. So do I have a second to that? Second. Motion? Thank you. You're too late, Fred. Too late, Dan. Fred, gotcha. Uh, any discussion? Any public comment? With that, I'll call the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. 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 All right. Thank you for five zero. Welcome again. Congratulations uh, on your promotion, sir. Next. Mm -hmm. Do I get a motion? I move that the board restructure uh, and promotions of command staff and furtherance of state and national police reform initiatives. Is there a second? Thank you, Fred. Any discussion from the board? Chief, would you like to give just a short explanation of what this means for folks? Um, yeah, um, it's several years ago, um, there was a task force on police, 21st century policing, and it listed several suggestions for police reform. And one of the most important suggestions is uh, to ensure adequate command oversight, to ensure the accountability and a system of internal checks um, and balances to ensure the police carry out their duties properly and are held responsible and also to uphold integrity of police force and um, to ensure community support of police. So this initiative is to further that goal and to have adequate supervision and command over police personnel. Thank you. Yeah. Any other discussion? Any public comment? And with that, we'll call the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, Motion carries 5-0. Last one. Madam Chair, I uh, move that the board uh, recommend the hiring of Mr. Kevin Riley, Mr. Jevin Downs, and Mr. Brendan Montre Moreno. <laughs> Any second? Second. Thank you, Dan. Any discussion? Any public comment? And with that, I call the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. 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 Thank you. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you, the board. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chief. Um, then agenda item number 11. Kurt, uh, your manager's report, including your recommendation for the budget for 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I get started, I just want to point out for anyone um, who uh, is here that has the budget or anyone at home, that um, there's lots of funds that have lots of um, requirements that have lots of uh, specific intent for them, certain funds that are very restricted. So I'll do my best. I'm not gonna be covering every line of every item, but I have a, a slide presentation that I'll start that uh, I'll work to go through. There is gonna be a second part or a, sec um, a component of the presentation that has to do with pool that our park and rec director is here that um, will come at the very end to um, go over some, some items that we wanna discuss with the board.
Okay. So the 2022 budget um, has been a while in the making. I wanna thank all the staff. A lot goes into this. There's a lot in this budget. And um, we'll start right off with the presumption of the sewer sale. As um, we've talked briefly before, I'm making four presumptions for the use of those proceeds that we pay off the sewer debt with the amount of the payoff savings that we would have. Granted, the uh, sewer debt is a requirement of the sale. However, by paying that off, you could see the savings of a little uh, $1.16 million. Setting aside uh, money for sewer reconciliations, which is um, outstanding items. We will continue to have bills for a period of time and some expenses that we will incur. Paying off our consultants um, who were part of the sale, $860,000, which has been discussed. And then I do make a uh, presumption in there of paying off the golf course debt, which we've talked about. That will have a direct impact of saving $2.943 million um, in uh, future payments that we will not have to make. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about in here, and I'll get back to this later, is the American Rescue Plan. That funding that we've talked about during this year, the township received the first half of that money, which is about $1.7 million. We'll receive the second part of that next year. Um, as we've talked about, there is provisions in there that have yet to be defined, and that has to do with sp spending on specific capital projects. However, there's also provision in there that has a formula for revenue shortfall projections where the GFOA, which is a Government Finance Officers Association, has put together the formulas for municipalities to calculate. That shortfall will allow us to utilize about half of that money of $1.7 million that allows us some uh, certain parameters, but more flexibility uh, for expenses for the township that we'll talk about um, in a little bit. So we'll go through many of these things, but I think to start, we're talking of a 2022 year-end fund balance of over $3 million. Over $3 million in paving, which totals 57 roads for this year and 11.41 miles. Um, you'll continue to hear me go back and forth between 57 and 59. I'll remind the board that we have an agreement with Falls where we paved Walnut Street or Walnut Lane and Elbow Lane this year that we're paying for next year. So essentially our road program for next year will have 59 roads, even though two of them are already completed. The budget also includes a $50,000 line item to update our website, $75,000 line, line item to update our permitting software, $60,000 to patch and repair the community park tennis courts, uh, completion of our multi-use trail, which is a carryover project, which is being primarily funded through a grant, a cost of approximately $700,000. And I'm gonna make a correction on that last line item. That is a golf course with a positive cash flow of $831,585 that will come back to later in the presentation. The 2022 budget includes the following capital purchases, four police cars, four police motorcycles. You'll hear later how we're essentially paying for that out of the rescue plan funding. Uh, a six wheel dump truck is part of our replacement plan in the public works department that is paid for out of the road machinery fund. Again, another separate fund in the township budget and a dump truck for the parks and recs department that were, I'd be recommending that we finance over the next three years. So in this year's budget, if you have the document, you can see it online. We have had two three-year plans that we continually update our paving plan and our trail maintenance plan that we've been following since we've instituted them. And for this year, a new three-year traffic maintenance, uh, traffic light maintenance plan this will be the first time that we've had a coordinated effort to do upgrades to our traffic lights uh, to keep them in good repair. So 
we've talked throughout the last couple of years about creating these funds where we create a very transparent um, process by which we can account for things, show the public where the money is, um, handle interfund transfers, what have you. So we have six new funds that you'll see, American Rescue Plan Fund that I've talked briefly about, the sewer sale proceeds funds, so in other words, where the money from the proceeds of the sale will be specifically tagged that you'll be able to see. And some of these funds we'll talk about with the upcoming presentation, a fund that I'm calling the Gulf Bond Repayment Fund, the Gulf Capital Reserve Fund, the Sidewalk Fee and Lua Fund, we'll talk about that in a little bit, and a Garden of Reflection Capital Reserve Fund. Even though I don't have that as its own separate slide, I would briefly say in the end, we know we have uh, the Garden of Reflection. We had the 20 year, um, commemoration this year where a great deal of money and time was spent by volunteers to um, to get that park to back to the condition that it was previously. Um, the hope being that we can start earmarking or setting aside a few dollars that as capital improvements are needed with whether it is the electrical, the fountain, what have you, um, that we can start having money sitting there to take care of those things if and when they come up. So, Kurt, it, sorry, Kurt, I, I know just because I know you don't have a slide on that one. Is that where um, we might put funds from the the outside nonprofit at some point to to address the Gardner reflection, or was that was that something totally different? Um, we have a memorial park fund that if and when that uh, uh, volunteer group provides funds or reimbursements that would be where that money would be housed um, uh, going forward. This funding would be sort of money that we set aside as would be needed to participate in those capital improvements in the future. Okay, thanks, Kerr. Um, so there are recommended staffing changes in the 2022 budget. The first thing that I wanna talk, we'll be talking about is reorganizing our planning and zoning department to the Department of Community Development to change the title of the planning director, not change the pay scale or anything, change the title to be a more reflective community development director position. Having the code enforcement officer become the building code official, then that in which he is qualified to do uh, and have that person directly oversee the consultants or the decisions um, are made by a staff person and not a consulting company. So those are not new hires, they are just a reformulation of positions, but hiring a full-time planner. The park and rec department, we're making the recommendation to hire a full-time pool manager. We have a pool manager now, those positions are getting increasingly difficult to fill everywhere. Um, primarily because people who have backgrounds in aquatics don't stay in areas where pools are open four to six months a year. They go to where it's warm. But what's happening is in pools all over the region is a lot of these places have had pool managers that have been there for 15 or 20 years. And as they retire or move on, finding replacements is extremely difficult. And we're spending more and more time trying to fill a position for the pool manager while there's a lot of other things to get the pool ready that it's taking us from. The other position in the park and rec department where I'm making the recommendation for is to hire a full-time administrative assistant. There are various positions down in the park and rec department who do various tasks and various things. The one thing the department does not have <laughs> is someone to assist those staff with answering phones, assisting with registrations, even making check requests and budget requests. And these are things that have caused difficulty for staff because items can fall easily between the cracks. Finally, the last position I have there is to create a new full-time fire services director to facilitate and coordinate the future of fire service in the township. And I'll be talking um, a bit more about that later. So what people always ask me is what about the taxes? So the 2022 manager's recommended budget makes a recommendation of a tax cut of a half a mil. The number on there, my apologies, uh, looks, it comes out to a mil and a half. <laughs> so it would go from 
21.01 to 20.51. It is a half a mil tax cut. That results in about a 21 or $22 tax cut for a typical house in Lower Makefield. That would see be a $400,000 house. We start off with the general fund. I go through these sheets to just put things in perspective. If we tar talk about a starting fund balance of $1.2 million and change, I, as I talked about previously, we accepted a $3 million down payment and deposit for sewers. But as was pointed out during our audit by our auditing firm, that $3 million is still listed as a liability because it cannot be put into fund balance until the close. So we have that listed in the 2022 budget um, as a cash item, as a revenue item that will be accepted into fund balance during the year. <clears throat> we can see all the various, we can, we'll be going through many of these different things. These are transfers, but in the end, what we talked about before briefly, a 2022 estimated year end fund balance of $3,190,685. And as I said in the budget message is a, in my opinion, a, a, an important threshold amount regarding our bond rating. We all know that we were downgraded um, about two years ago as a result of the 2018 audit. Uh, that $3 million deposit for the sewer system assisted in the negative outlook being removed. I would imagine that Moody's would be contacting me for a spring meeting to reevaluate our bond rating um, for next year. So to just go through a, a real brief overview all of the items in the budget these are listed in the general fund in the first 14 pages of the budget the central government um, uh, portion of the budget that includes the manager the assistant the stenographer various professional services outlined with a 2022 number of eight hundred and thirty nine thousand dollars and change we have the general um, uh, general expenditures, as well as the category that includes our medical insurance, various social security matches, funding for our various um, citizen advisory groups of $3,018,000 and change. Our finance administration, which includes three full-time and one part-time person, with an amount of $286,833. The Office of the Tax Collector, which covers wages, bonded, postage, um, et cetera, with a budget fairly consistent with what that number is every year of $38,950. Um, our information technology budget, which is primarily under contracted services for permitting, finance software, everything that we have, um, virtual, virtual meetings to be included in there as well, although we're calling them hybrid now for at least the board, the planning commission, EAC, park and rec, and the zoning hearing board, $228,000 and change. So our police department, which is obviously the largest department in the township, a little over $6 million, um, covers all costs, 40 officers, four full-time civilian employees, um, not listed in this number, but separate that we'll talk about later. It's going to be the items uh, listed in the capital budget that we'll talk about that I touched on briefly at the beginning. Uh, money coming from the American Rescue Plan Fund for four police cruisers, four motorcycles, and business, modific or business building modifications on our second floor regarding meeting rooms, interview spaces, what have you for the police department um, to modify the building. That was an item that was in the budget this year to start to explore that. And that was put on hold um, with everything that's been going on. The planning and zoning department, I still have that listed as planning and zoning. I'm making the recommendation, obviously, that we change that to the community development department um, for this budget that does include the community development director, building code official planner, and two permit administrators. And it also includes uh, the, the building uh, inspections company that we use, as well as the related cost with the zoning hearing board and planning commission. Now, 
I have put this together and we talked about this regarding that planning and zoning department. Um, so I just, I wanna point out for the public that when we, that department this year is gonna handle about 2,300 permits. Um, and we have a staff of essentially people processing those, one administrative assistant, a code enforcement officer and a building guy, and Mr. Majewski. Um, and there are job descriptions in that packet to see. Essentially, the, the plan would be to promote or change the title of the code enforcement officer to building code official, have him still be in charge and oversee code enforcement. That planner that's there would, would oversee reviews and plans and what have you, but also be used for code enforcement. In my description of the department, I think everyone knows that we all have lots of calls regarding code enforcement, property maintenance issues, and we have one person to do that for 12,000 or so properties. Um, so in the end, we believe that having a planner in place, having a building code official in place that would oversee all of the permitting, all of the inspections, and then the community development director to get involved when needed, but to be able to do things from a more macro perspective. Jim Majewski, as we all know, gets called into lots of different things regarding stormwater and projects and parks and everybody utilizes him. Um, my opinion is, is this reconfiguration would it allow Jim to be more in that role that would be traditional for such a department. And frankly, uh, well within his skill set as, as an engineer a planner to do all of those things. <clears throat> Our public works department. Um, I think we, you know, we talk a lot about what they do. Uh, includes a public works director, administrative assistant, 13 laborers. And we know this includes the budget that covers building maintenance, the recycle yard, leaf collection, basin maintenance, highway, snow and ice, all capital related expenses, their trucks, their dump trucks are in the fund that we talked about before the road machinery fund. And that fund is right here. This is its own millage of 0.3 mils specifically for road equipment. In the last few years, we have been, we have uh, uh, active in utilizing short-term financing to purchase 10 wheel dump truck, the new street sweeper that you've seen out, uh, as well as a 5,500 dump truck, wheel loader and backhoe. We're only recommending one additional purchase next year for a six wheel international dump truck um, with a fund balance of about $36,000 at the end of the year. As I started this from a couple of years ago, we will be putting out, and these are the days that we are recommending for the recycle, um, for the recycle yard for next year. Uh, it is consistent with last year where we did five Saturdays, um, you know, uh, three between April 2nd and May 21st, and then one in September and October, and then the Mondays that we offer during the year. We have an ambulance fund that's in the budget. It is being recommended to keep the millage as is. Uh, this fund provides assistance to the Yardley Makefield emergency unit, ambulance unit um, that um, serves the township. We have a fire hydrant fund, not recommended any change that covers the costs associated with the water, uh, the cost of the water, the pressurization of the water for approximately 900 fire hydrants that are in the township. We have our park and recreation budget. Um, as we said, we have the recommendation for the additional hires. The pool manager that we were talking about essentially would be paid for primarily out of the pool budget, although part of that pay would be uh, assigned here. That 2022 uh, uh, budget also includes, we've done our three-year trail plans um, that we have listed right here, would include over 4,000 feet of trail for 2022. Even though we sort of been sort of plucking along 30 and $40,000 at a time, the trails as we've seen them, if you've been out and about, it's a, it's a remarkable difference as we continue uh, to work our way through the town. 
Um, this is the fund that I, I did want to talk about here, the sidewalk fee in lieu of fund. In past years, uh, developers um, have paid the township fees for um, not putting in sidewalks for developments that the board approves. This will be the first time that we've set aside that money specifically, where as that money comes in, it'll be in this separate account um, that that would, could be used for at the board's discretion, new sidewalks or new trails. Um, unfortunately, not to repair old ones, but to, to provide new connections. So that $50,000 um, contribution came in this year and it was the opportune time to set up this fund to separate those dollars um, moving forward. So the next fund that I would like to talk about is the debt services fund. Uh, this fund is exclusively used for debt payments where we have assigned non-golf and non-sewage related debt. Um, it is not limited to bond debt or long-term debt. It can be used for short-term debt as well. In fact, we have police radios that we purchased from the county that were financed over seven years, that this is where it's paid from. So this year, right now, that millage towards our bond debt payment is 2.79 mills with the bond payment of $1,733,000. Next year, that bond payment will shift downwards, okay? to $862,606. Specifically broken out, that would require 1.09 mills to make that payment. Again, the current millage is 2.79. Basic math would say then we're 1.7 mills in excess of what we need to make the debt payment. So with that, I am making three recommendations for the board um, in regards to um, the, that 1.70 uh, millage amount. So you'll see highlighted their first recommendation, which is to allocate one mill to a new road loan, which I will explain, but to keep a running tab of the millage. If we did that, then that translates to an updated millage need of 2.09 mills. So what does one mill for a road loan look like? So the budget recommends approving a $1,650,000 three-year loan to be used for paving with $1,500,000 directly for paving and $150,000 to be dedicated to design, uh, bidding, inspection, what have you. That loan itself would be paid quarterly from that debt services fund over three years. And that one mill will accommodate that debt service for that three year period. So just to show how that would look, we made three payments of that in 2022. You could see the 12th and final payment would be made in 2025. And then if you see the asterisk by 2025 and the one through three in parentheses, that would represent the presumption that another loan would be taken in 2025, paid off as you can see in 2028, and then, a, and then the next loan taken um, in 2028 after the 12th payment is made. But under that plan, that translates over seven years to $4.5 million in paving, an additional $4.5 million in paving. And again, um, or the point being here in the end is that this could be done under the current framework of the millage that we have, where a mill would be assigned to this road loan and would be done without creating an additional charge to the residents to do so. That $1.5 million in paving translates to an additional five miles of paving generally in our paving program. Standardizing the paving program, the loan program in the paving program dramatically increases the miles we pave over time. And that seven year period of paving of $4.5 million translates to approximately $15 million 
or 15, excuse me, 15 miles of road paving over that seven year period. So the existing debt service is 2.79 mils, as I've said repeatedly. If we talk about the bond, the bond payment needing 1.09 mils, the road loan taking up one mil, we're sitting at 2.09 mils. My second recommendation is to reallocate 0.2 of those mils to the fire protection fund to accommodate the hiring of a fire services director. This will increase the fire fund millage obviously by two tenths of a mil from 0.9 mils to 1.1 mils. And obviously then we would still have a millage in the debt service fund of 2.09. A fire services director, um, as far as all of, besides the, all of the technical qualifications and requirements, would oversee commercial inspections and plan reviews, would serve as the fire marshal, would assist with volunteer staffing challenges, coordinating with neighboring departments to address shortfalls and regional capital needs, and even assist with fire calls during the day. Having a staff person, in my opinion, dedicated to fire services, investigations, inspections, plan reviews, volunteer status, gaps in service, outreach, and regional opportunities will allow the township to stay informed and engaged on this issue moving forward. Um, I said this uh, previously when we were talking about fire service and a lot of people in the township don't realize in the end because we think of the volunteer departments sort of as they are their own entity, but this all falls into the purview of, of the volunteer company. Fire service is the township's responsibility. If suddenly there's issues with staffing or shortage in volunteers, injuries, problems, those are all the township's burden and concern to have. To me, um, elevating this position where the township has essentially a person to keep up with those things, to track those things, to assist in those things is needed. And we're going to increasingly see this in communities across the Commonwealth and specifically across Bucks County. That fire protection budget, as I said, last year's budget is 0.9 mils. This year, the recommendation is to make that 1.10 mils. So this would cover the hiring of a full-time fire services director and also provide assistance to our local companies. The township is also required to cover and provide for the costs of workers' compensation insurance um, uh, for the volunteers. Um, there is some state money that we get that if you see, I list as $290,000, which is fire relief money, which then goes back to a component of those volunteer companies um, every year, dollar for dollar. So if we take the debt service millage, right, we're talking of 2.09 mils, 0.2 mils being reallocated to the fire services fund, which would result in the net an impact of a net half a mil, 0.5 millage tax cut. So now I'll take us back to the American Rescue Plan. As I had mentioned, we have this provision that we can have a revenue shortfall calculator, which I have done, which will allow us to bring $1.7 million back into the general fund with more flexibility than the other pot of money that's sitting there and will continue to sit there at large which would likely need to be dedicated to stormwater improvements. So what I have listed for these projects includes uh, 191 plus thousand dollars for the replacement of the culvert at South Drive. For the board members here, I will remind you that that was a topic of discussion at last year's budget and was determined that that would exceed our capacity to, to fund last year, uh, purchasing four police cars and motorcycles that um, I mentioned earlier. But I, I would mention this going forward, uh, again, in my opinion, um, without having the chief um, I feel like uh, this is my statement. Frankly, the township should constantly be focused on replacing four police cars a year. Um, 
you know, these police cars, again, will have a, a, an expected life or a useful life of about five years, maybe six. And when we extend them beyond that, our vehicle maintenance budget goes up and the trade-in values of those cars goes down. So getting ourselves onto a, um, an anticipated or, 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 or more automated system by which we replace four cars um, well, well is, is valuable to the department and to the township moving forward. And as such, the budget is reflective of that. Uh, as I mentioned from this, we're talking of $135,000 being dedicated uh, to, to, to making upgrades to the second floor of the building. Um, we have $365,000 essentially that we're putting in to assist for public safety generally in the budget, which is permitted. And then finally, $750,000 towards our 2022 road program. Uh, again, we talk about money coming from different areas, and you already heard me all talk about a, a loan program with $1.5 million in paving. I'm talking about that being sort of an ongoing recurring process that we continue to upgrade um, our paving numbers. This we're talking about is essentially almost the equivalent of, 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 of a, of, of a one-time influx of cash to assist with our paving program for next year. So I'll go to the third pot of money that we talked about with roads, liquid fuels money. This is money that comes from the state that is based on a variety of calculations that I will not bore you with that has to do with number of local miles, size of the town, uh, population of the town, excuse me, we pay for certain staff expenses out of here, rock salt, and we do paving. And frankly, over the years, our paving has been, except with a few exceptions, relegated to this pot of money. Um, in this budget, we're recommending $777,233 towards paving. And you can see we have a year end fund balance of about $46,000. I'd like to talk now next about roads. So as I mentioned, I'm suggesting a paving budget of over $3,078,000 next year. And you can see where I've listed out where that money would come from. That $51,158 that you see in the fourth bullet is money that we are setting aside or that we approved previously to pave Walnut Lane and Elbow Lane in an agreement with shared roads with Falls Township that we have till March 31st to pay next year. So again, if you factor those two roads in, um, that translates to 59 total roads that we'd be paying for or, 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 or factoring for next year. That totals 11.41 miles next year. So what I'd like to do next is, is we'll start with we have a three-year road program. And the road program that I'm proposing this year would essentially equate compared to what we've done on average over the years to four years worth of paving next year. And you can see, um, I always like, and, 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 and I'll say that some roads we'll see are, are much older and haven't been paved in a long time. We know we had the example of silo this year that hadn't been paved in 40 years. Some roads because of how much traffic they have on them can last much longer. Other roads that might be cut through roads or have heavy traffic might last eight to 12 to 15 years. Generally, you're gonna hear me say this later, I would say generally that we create a blended average of a lifespan of a road of 20 years. Some are more, some are less, but 20 years. So um, I'm excited because this is the biggest number of roads I've presented. Typically this is one page. So this is the first page you can see all the roads listed. Second page that we have, which lists roads. Um, we looked at Yardley Meadows, all the roads there were from 79. Stony Hill homes from, most of them from the late 70s. Big Oak Bend, we have the Collector Road at East Ferry. Tanglewood, Highview Estates, all of those are mid 80s road. I'd venture to guess that probably haven't been paved since they were built. And then if we go into the fourth page, we'd be talking of um, roads, as you can see there in the end, that total out to 11.41 miles. Now, 
to just keep going for a second. 2023, this is the road and the three-year plan, but I, I'd like to point out, because I think it's important, um, if, we would be, if we were to have a typical paving year, these would be roads that you wouldn't, be see pa you wouldn't see paved until 2026, 2027, 2028. And since uh, I, I know um, um, uh, Supervisor Lewis and I talked about this earlier, I will say this, because I know it's important to him and all of you. When, if this is, we approve this, and whenever we put the road program out, yes, we will have bid alternates out there that if we get fantastic pricing, that some of these roads, we'll try to move some of these roads up. And then if we go to the 2024 roads, as you can see, um, typically what you'll see, and this is using essentially just liquid fuels funding as the previous year was. You can see the dollar amounts that we're talking about, 700 plus thousand dollars, two and a half miles or so um, in roads. But this is the, the next, I'm gonna let me see. I only have a couple of road slides left, I promise but most people are interested in this stuff. Everyone loves a good one. So let's talk about road paving moving forward and I'll call it 2022 to 2028. This is that same seven year period that I talked about taking road loans every three years. So if you factor this year's mileage in with what you saw with 23 and 24, and then if we continued and we kept that road loan in place, 2025 and 2028, I'll call this a blended average of miles of roads moving forward. So during those seven years, that would generally translate to 36.57 miles of road or 5.22 miles of road average per year. If we assume, right, as I said, that a blended average for when we should be paving roads is every 20 years, that translates to 6.9 miles of road, generally on average per year. Over seven years, that, trans, that comes out to 48.3 miles. Now, that falls short of this by 11.73 miles over seven years. The point I'm gonna make is by, by standardizing this loan program, we are starting from a much higher base of average roads that we'd be paving every year. And this will provide a clear benchmark for the board moving forward about how we bridge that gap. To me, I think every year having a budget discussion where board members are saying, how much money can we take from the general fund extra this year to get more mileage to hit that benchmark even closer? And frankly, if you do the math and we say that paving costs maybe 280 to 300,000 miles a year. It gives us a very clear direction going forward that if we were able to budget an extra three to $400,000 a year out of other funds, it will get us on that pace to start doing roads consistent with what we believe the replacement time should be. Next. Kurt, can I ask you a quick question on, your, on the roads? Yep. Uh, <laughs> Don't worry, it won't be painful. Um, th this, you know, we're paving a lot of roads, which is great. Um, I'm wondering if, if in, in, the, in the event that I'm, I don't want to say too much of a good thing, but when I see 11.4 miles of roads in one year, um, I always think, well, what's that look like in practice when we actually have the construction out there from a uh, traffic perspective and potential headache perspective? Um, that, that I, I'm curious as to practic from a practical perspective what that would look like and how we could stage that to avoid lots of phone calls to the office saying, hey, I can't get out of my driveway or whatever it may be in different parts of town. Because it's a great number of roads. It's just um, it's, a, it's a pretty good number um, in a short amount of time. So I'm, that's something I'd like. You don't have to answer that now. It's just something I'm interested in personally. Well, all I'll point out is this, uh, point taken, right? So obviously, um, when, when you're doing 57 roads instead of 13 roads, there needs to be a lot more coordination, a lot more notification. Um, however, the size of this road program um, is, you know, a Falls Township Road Program this year was $3.1 million. 
Now, Falls Township has obviously pots of money and things that enable them to do that. So my point being that we have contractors out there that are bidding road programs this size um, that I will say presumably would be more experienced in uh, the scale and scope of a project for such notifications. And that would obviously have to be something that would require our attention um, even more so than a traditional year. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to ask point, all like, the supervisors to just hold their questions to the end of the presentation because um, that way he can get through this and then we can have the discussion that's intended to happen. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, next, I'd like to talk about golf. <laughs> um, as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, the presumption is, is that the golf debt would be paid off. And uh, in coordinating with uh, Spirit Golf and Mr. Atera, we will be assuming a surplus of $831,585. Um, that surplus is occurring because there is not a big bond payment sitting there hanging over it. However, um, for next year, and I'm going to talk beyond next year a little bit, the recommendation on that surplus would be first $125,000 for capital expenses for the golf course in 2022. One thing I haven't talked about much, which is the case, is you know over the last couple of years under this board, you all have approved budgets for bunker repairs that we've been doing to the tune of forty to $60,000 a year. However, there are other capital repairs that because we've not been flush with cash and has been difficult to pay for because this is presumably paid for by it's an enterprise, the golfers, um, our ability to do that has been limited. So for next year would be to spend, to budget 125,000 for the golf course itself. I'm recommending assigning $50,000 towards a golf bond repayment fund. Um, as you all know, in the end, there is a $14 million or so debt that is being repaid, that is being, that is being paid off as a result of the sale of another asset. And as such, um, I do think it is appropriate that that golf course, albeit not at 1.5 or $1.6 million a year, which was crippling towards it, that we begin to set that process forward to repay that. Now, granted, $50,000 is a small amount, but the point is, is to get this to be an automated um, process. Um, a $400,000 repayment to the general fund for operational assistance provided during the last four years, $51,585 in a golf capital reserve fund, and $205,000 to go into the recreation capital reserve fund for the match needed for the Woodside Road bike path. I'd like to talk about each of those things, most of those things briefly if we could. So the operational assistance, if we start to look at how much money has the general fund in the last four years assisted the golf course, the first three numbers there are actual. This is an estimated this year, which because the golf course has rebounded very well with people anxious to get back golfing. So we have a four-year total of just under 1.9 million. I'm essentially recommending repaying that over five years at 400,000 a year or so. The golf bond repayment fund. This is the point I'll make. We're saying $50,000 to this, right? Um, there's the total debt that we're talking about being paid off. The point I'll make to the board, though, is even though $50,000 may not feel consequential in the scope of a $14 million repavement, if we pay off this previous fund I just mentioned at $400,000 a year, starting in 2027, we could sit then and increase this fund you have $400,000 that is no go that, that the general fund has been repaid would give you the opportunity to do other things, but to sit and assign this towards a greater extent to pay that debt off. The other thing I will add in that is a new account in the budget is a golf capital reserve fund. Um, this set aside would be dedicated to long term capital needs of the golf course. So in the past, when we've often talked about expensive improvements always being funded through debt, 
setting aside 50 to $100,000 a year or so would allow us to start to have expenses as large uh, or money set aside as large expenses come up. So I use the example that the irrigation system on the golf course that probably has about another 10 years left will cost a million dollars or more. And if we start to set that money aside 50 or $100,000 a year, when that comes due, we can sit there and pay for it without having to sit and make dramatic uh, 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 changes in the budget, ask for the taxpayers to pay for it. This is essentially the golf course users repay or, or paying for those improvements over time. And then finally, um, where I talk about assigning $205,000 to the capital, to the Recreation Capital Reserve Fund. We talked about that this would be for this year, for the project that we have out of that fund to assist with the match for the Woodside Road bike path. Um, we are getting $405,000 in grants. The project itself is estimated to cost $610,000. But moving forward, um, to just talk about these items in general, or essentially these these five areas to use um, surplus revenues from the golf course. And this is just an estimate on an annual basis. Existing capital needs for the course, 100,000. General fund repayment, 400,000 through 26. A recreation capital reserve allocation, an estimate of 150,000 a year. But what I like about this then in the end is, <laughs> We don't have to spend that money every year. We can let that build a balance where we can use that as a match for other things. You could use it for trails, you could use it for parks, whatever you wanted. However, I think the important point is, is that these improvements for the benefit of taxpayers would be paid by golfers and, and essentially user fees and not through taxes. The golf capital reserve fund and that golf bond repayment as general, just talking point numbers. <clears throat> quickly going forward as quickly as I can. <laughs> We're talking this year of, of, of special projects. Most of these are holdover projects. We've already talked about this, 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 this upgrade that we're gonna have to eventually do in the quiet zone um, with the report from the FRA coming with, uh, that's supposed to be forthcoming for a four quadrant gate system. There's still $500,000 sitting in there. Uh, the signal, uh, the Big Oak, uh, Makefield Road signal upgrade, the multi-use trail, those are all coming from grants. We talked earlier about the permit and complaint software uh, for the codes department, the website uh, update. That's where all of these things are housed. Under our capital reserve fund, we've talked about these and I just don't want there to be confusion for where these things are that they seem redundant. But all of those items that we've talked about, the culvert, the, the paving, it's not from liquid fuels, including loan proceeds for paving the cars. Um, you know, we've talked, I didn't really talk much about this, um, except from the last meeting. Um, you know, we do have, we'll be coming um, these PEG grants from our cable franchise agreements to be used to upgrade all the equipment here to go to high def cameras to, to change all of this stuff around to be um, uh, uh, more modern than it currently is. Finally, I'm just gonna go through this quickly. Final budget summary. Essentially what outlines in this budget is paying off the golf and sewage debt, which would save the township four plus million dollars, an overall tax cut of a half a mil, an estimated year end fund balance of just under $3.2 million. The creation of a Roan loan program under the debt services fund, which will allow for a $1.5 million in additional paving an overall paving budget of over $3 million encompassing 59 roads and 11.4 miles, the hiring of a fire services director, a planner, a full-time pool manager, and an administrative assistant, the reorganization of our planning department uh, and the upgrade of our code software, upgrading our website and our video and camera capabilities, repairing the community park tennis courts, repairing over 4,400 linear feet of township trails, completion of the multi-use trail and Big Oak Road signalization process, project, the creation of a three-year traffic maintenance plan, the purchase of four cars and four motorcycles, the renovation of the second floor of the, of the uh, township building, positive operational, cash operational golf course with dedicated funding, 
still $1.7 million left in the American Rescue Plan, which would essentially be limited, but allowed to be used for stormwater improvements, which we know there's several things in the township we're looking at, and a sewage sale proceeds account in excess of $20 million. So I do wanna rem remind everyone here in the end that other than the $3 million deposit that we've taken um, and paying off the golf course and the sewage debt, no part of those proceeds have gone into anything you've seen in this. We're not spending money to hire people to, we're not spending sewage proceeds money to pave, to do any of these things. Um, this is essentially the result of the positive aspects of the sewage sale from the golf course um, sale to, to the debt restructuring, to everything we're doing that, has, that will lead to um, all of this punch list of items. Now, that's all I have, Suzanne. I will defer to you. And I'm gonna have Monica talk about the pool um, because there's some things we need to discuss that if you wanna defer all questions until she's done, because I'm sure there will be pool questions, or if you wanna take questions to what we've done to this point, I will defer to you how you wanna handle that. Um, it's already late. I only imagine it's gonna get later. I would uh, prefer if Monica had the opportunity to present now and then hopefully uh, she'll be able to Go home as the rest of us continue. I just Monica, I'll run that. I have that right up on the screen. Yeah. Keep it close to you. I'll get closer. All right. So um, if you take a look at this slide right here, it's just basic revenue expenses for the pool. And you'll note a significant jump in both regular revenue. Um, and expenses uh, this next year. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what that jump is and how we plan to cover it um, with different fees. Um, this year, we noticed that we had significant staffing issues and that was due a lot uh, because we were having trouble hiring. And secondly, because um, a lot of our young staff are getting paid much higher at other locations. For instance, they could work at a grocery store or Walmart and make a lot more money and not have to worry about saving lives. Um, so we really took that into account when we were putting together this budget, did a lot of analysis. And um, that's really what drove up our expenses for this next year. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So if you just take, I just took a, a quick search of different salary ranges for different jobs, summertime hire jobs, youth pay jobs. Um, and this is kind of what I, came up with, you can find a lot more out there. Um, a lot of different companies now are continuously raising their minimum wage. Um, right now, if you see those bottom two lines there, you can see that we pay our staff currently $8.25 an hour to $11.25 an hour, and that's for non-management wage. I'm proposing that we increase those wages from to $9.50 to $14.50 to be more competitive and more exciting for these young employees to come work. Oh, I, I relaxed a little bit here, I'm sorry. Um, so if you just take a look at that real quick, I'm not gonna go through each one, but you can kind of see um, just picking groceries, you get paid $15.88 an hour at the grocery store. Um, you get $10 an hour as a base pay at Sesame Place plus a $300 sign-on bonus. Um, you see more of that sign-on bonus going on. Um, I, I didn't want to get into a sign-on bonus so much because um, I'm finding that people are leaving jobs as soon as they get a sign-on bonus and then going to the next job and getting the next sign-on bonus. I didn't really want to um, get into that. Um, so what I did was took an analysis of a number of area pools. Um, as you know, we're, we participate in the Bucksmont Consortium and we all talk and we're all dealing with this right now. Um, I picked three for this presentation because I didn't feel like you really needed to go through the whole analysis I went to, but I'd be glad to share whatever um, you would like. Um, one of the pools I looked at and, and wanted to share with you is Fanny Chapman, because it's very comparable to us. It's about 100 years old over time. Um, the, they do have an endowment fund that helps pay, um, but it is completely covered by revenue, just like our pool, but they do have the support of the endowment fund. Um, they do not use taxpayer money. They have, um, a total of five pools, as you can see here, that they've developed over time. And you can see their fees. 
um, right here. So I just wanted to share those with you. Next slide is a local pool, a little bit smaller than ours, but I just wanted to share the fees so you can kind of see what it is compared to ours. Um, a lot less by way of amenities, um, fees are a lot lower. And then if you look at Hatfield Aquatic Center, pretty comparable to our pool, they do have a lazy river and they have a um, heated therapy pool as part of that complex you can see on the bottom there. Um, their fees are based on a family size, which we did see a lot. So, um, you know, family size. And, and when I look at that, I think, oh my gosh, having to manage all those different family fees um, must be crazy on the back end. Um, but um, that's how they that's how they do theirs. So this is our pools. We have similar amenities um, to Hatfield and Fanny Chapman. Um, you could I just wanted to show you the picture so you can kind of see for reference. And on the next slide here, you can see our current fee structure. So the way we're trying to make up is um, by changing the way we do our membership fees. And when Kurt and I first looked at this, we said, wow, we're going to have to raise all the rates, 27%, 23% in order to make this work. So I said, that's just not acceptable. Let me go back and try to figure out how we could rework things. And when I really started looking at our fees, and these are things that I've noticed before, of course, um, you know, for two individuals, it costs more than a family membership, which I just think is a little bit crazy. And, you know, the, the structure of things isn't necessarily, it's always worth reevaluating. I'm, I'm going to say that. So I took a look at it and I took the concept from other pools of changing per family size and also considered some of the complaints that we've gotten over the time about, you know, um, a single parent with one child is paying for a full family membership that a family of 10 would be paying the same amount. Um, so I try to look at it um, and make it a little bit more equitable. So the new structure we're going to propose this year, and I'll, um, I'll go over it, is this structure that's kind of like an a la carte uh, structure based on your family. Um, so with this structure in place, people can pay for the members of the family who are using the pool. And um, it's a little bit more flexibility. We reevaluated the senior membership. There was a senior limited evening only membership. Uh, truthfully, we have a lot of problems with that membership. A lot of the members end up switching over so they can have access to say water aerobics and other things. So instead of that, we did include a discount period for that uh, for the year. So you could get a uh, use the discount period to get a lesser amount, but you still get full access to everything at the pool. Um, and the fees are broken down by age. Another thing I want to highlight, um, which I think I need to change the wording because I've gotten some questions now that this is live on the internet, but um, adult 14 and older, the first two adults so that are, are, that are 14 and older are 175 apiece. And then any additional adult which is the wording that I need to change, would be $95, so third and beyond. So I will change the wording on that for future uh, reference, but this is kind of the structure. And with this being said, I kind of wanted to break down families for you and show you kind of what that cost would look like for different families. Um, so this next slide here shows our pool currently and the different size breakdowns of the family and kind of where our layout is. And most of our families are in that four or five range, um, just to kind of go over that for you so you could see it. I did um, from there, oh, I, I wanted to go over rate related rules. So with this, there's going to have to be some rules in place um, so that when those questions are asked, we try to anticipate as many of them. The age cutoff will be the day before the pool opens. So if you turn 14 before the pool opens, you're paying as an adult. If you turn 14 after the pool opens, you're paying as a child. And same with every age. Um, proof of residency is required to obtain resident rates. Different households cannot be on the same account. Guest passes are for guests of members. There will not be day pass if you're not with a member. In order to receive any type of swim lessons, you must be a member. All swim team members must have a membership. 
Only members can reserve the pavilions. No refunds after the start of the season. And that a lot of these are current. Um, if registra registering a child or 14 or under, an adult over the age of 18 from the same household will also be required to have a membership. So these are some of the rate related rules that we will have in place. Monica, should that be 13? Did I not change it? No, I'm asking you. Oh yeah, it is Thir under the age of 13. Because if you're over 14, you can use the pool so okay. you are an adult. Thank you. Um, so I did uh, just take a sampling of different families. This is a family of two. You can see all the different various rates they would pay. Family of two, one child, one adult. Um, resident discount period would be $250 for the season. Non-resident discount would be $335. Um, a resident, you can see all along the bottom. I'm not going to read each one of them, but I just want you to get a visual. And the same goes uh, on the next slide for a family of three. You could see how the rate changes. Now, this would be different for different scenarios, but of course, I just wanted to give you, I just picked a family out and used it as a model. Um, and then on to four, you can kind of see the rates there on the bottom. And on a uh, family of five profile. And I only went to five because that covers the majority of our, our members. Um, and then in the end, uh, there's going to be some other changes with rates. Um, one of the bigger changes is the guest passes will increase. So if you have a mom that gets an annual pass or a dad that gets an annual pass and the other parent isn't going to come regularly, if they wanted to buy a book of 10 passes, they could pay $180, but it's going to be 20, it's going to be 20 a pass if you buy them individually. Um, and that uh, hopefully will encourage more people to get memberships if they're going to be there more than that. Um, and lessons will go up lightly, uh, pavilion rental, pavilion rental. Um, and then on the next slide, right now we sell private one-on-one -on -one instruction. What we'd like to do is uh, provide semi-private lessons with, because we couldn't really reach everybody for lessons. So um, if we could do small groups of like uh, members, offer semi-private uh, lessons as well. So we put a rate in for that. Um, if you guys, um, that's all I have today. Nope. I don't, Suzanne, I'm, so, because I know, like, where the questions I had when we talked about this. Mm -hmm. So, while this is a much more creative a la carte approach, I don't want to try to camouflage the fact that in the end, and in the end, part of what, what started this was the need to, to attract the staff that we need to keep the pool open. We'll remind everyone of a couple of facts. This year, because of both related um, child labor laws with limitations that we have, re safety requirements for staffing, um, and the limits that we had did require us, and some people were unhappy with the closing of the pool between three and four. We had examples of other pools that opened much later in the year, opened for only weekends, uh, uh, did a whole slew of things. So in the end, I don't want there to be any misconception. In the end, this plan will generate more revenue to allow us to accommodate pays that we believe will fully staff us. And while we could sit and go through and pick and choose, in my own brief analysis of this, and we know I love numbers, many of the people um, that would have memberships that are of smaller families have more a la carte possibilities by which they will pay less. I believe the breaking point, and Monica, you can correct me, we still get to the point that if it is a, if it is a four person membership with four, two adults and two kids, your fees at about that threshold will go up. They will go up. Um, they're probably gonna go up about, it's probably 15 to 18% or so. The people who are the seniors and those that have more flex, the, those that have, um, you know, smaller families, uh, you know, Monica and I are talking like we have memberships we're looking at of like a single mother and, and her one child or two children are paying the same fee as a family of seven. Uh, and in the end, um, you know, even for the larger families, because I've talked to these people as well, they buy a family membership, they have four kids, one's off to college that they don't use it, another kid is working and doesn't swim anywhere, they can sit and pare that down. But make no mistake in the end if all of them are going in those fees will go up 
Um, but I think what Monica has presented is the option for people to select what works best for them, understanding in the end, we're trying to become more competitive to have the staff that we need. Uh, I'm gonna stop this share now, if that's okay. That's the last slide, right, Monica? Okay. So the official presentation portion is, is complete? That's it, that's everything we have. Well, then let me unless you want more but uh, I, I, I need some more slides I, I do want to thank you Kurt um, for presenting a, a very thoughtful and thorough budget that not only lays out what 2022 might look like but helps us to cast a vision into the future years so that we uh, can move forward with some more discipline and planning as we rebuild the foundation of our township. Um, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, I, I've had the privilege of looking at it for a while. So um, I'm gonna turn the floor over. First, I'll ask Fred if you have anything you'd like to ask. Not at this time. Okay. Not at this time. Okay. James? No, I just wanna echo that sentiment, Suzanne. Um, you know, ton of work that uh that went into that Kurt and I uh, truly appreciate you doing uh you doing an amazing job with that I know it's not a small undertaking so I just want to uh, give kudos to you and the team for putting it together but I, I don't have any further questions on it at this point thank you John sure thanks Monica for the uh, pool presentation couple quick questions and I'm uh the town site manager briefed me on this on Monday talked a little bit about it. Have you thought about what the new rate structure will do to utilization in the pool? Because some of the changes I think are very positive. They also have a potential to increase the amount of people in the pool at any given time. Um, so I'm wondering the sort of the balance. So if you, for example, encourage a lot more memberships with fewer people in a family, do those people end up using the pool more often? or does the total number of people in the pool increase? That can actually be a good thing if those people are spending at the snack bar or they're, you know, and they're not hitting the peak. But I'm wondering if you've thought about that at all as a, a potential concern? I have thought about it, that it could potentially, um, but we, you know, to be quite frank, we don't even come near capacity on a regular basis. Um, we could, there are times we come close, mm -hmm. but we don't necessarily come to capacity. So um, there is room, but we also have to consider how we would handle it. Everybody. So you're comfortable then that you're not worried that we're going to hit capacity frequently at all? I am not concerned that we would hit. Capacity. Okay, that's good. Um, and then have you sort of estimated out how many people you think will take the different membership levels? Well, the best way for me to evaluate it was with what we know from past. Yep, yeah. So I took the data from this last year because our membership was the highest it ever was. Mm -hmm. And uh, Monica, can you move the microphone up a little bit closer? There you go. Thank you. There we go. Um, awesome. Thanks. So I took the membership that we had last year and I broke it down by age bracket individually. It, it took a lot of maneuvering mm -hmm. around. Um, I've, I've um, figured out if everybody registered this year in that format, <laughs> um, how much we would make in revenue. So that came to that number that you see in the budget. Okay. So, cool. uh, 1, 32,000, I believe. And then the other question, and I'll let you go on this was, uh, there were, I believe 18 people with over six people in their uh, household, something like that. Yeah, I'd have to look back at the slide. Or was it 20, that. something like that. It was, yeah. um, is there any cap here that we consider for those folks? I think we're talking about a very small portion of people. Kurt and I talked a little bit back and forth about that. I did not, as part of this plan, set a cap but it's not impossible. Yeah. I mean, that's something that you'd want to do. I mean, if you have that many kids, I mean, you got to get a break somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, have to, I have to tell you, I have a lot of kids and I anticipate paying more yeah. for my family. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Having five myself. So those are just some initial thoughts in terms of how to, if you, you're comfortable with modeling and you take the peaks, I don't necessarily think that the, uh, I'm certain no one likes rate increases, but they certainly appreciate that they've got to pay for the cost of the amenities. So the Parks and Rec Board provide any analysis on this? 
to, I to, to be honest, I did not have this ready for the last park board meeting, so I plan to bring it to this next week. Okay, cool. Meeting. Thanks. Mm -hmm. But they did have a, uh, a chance to look at this ahead of this meeting. Okay. And then um, that's all I had in the park pool, which now you got me thinking, do I want to go next year? So that's a good sign. Right, Steve. Um, <laughs> on the broader budget, a couple of questions around the fire service director. The one challenge that uh, I had originally when we had heard from um, the volunteer fire groups was the large challenge is the number of volunteers. And I think the assessment was that we were 10 volunteers short. <laughs> And my thought about this is that seems to be the first biggest issue. And are there things that we could be doing short of hiring a fire service director to address that in the interim to see what we can do to improve that as a possibility? I know we have some time to review this. I just throw that out there, something to think about. Um, and I haven't had a chance to talk with any of the volunteer groups about what their thoughts are on this. So I definitely will be touching base with them. Um, and then some of the other stuff, obviously, we're just getting first review. So I would imagine I'll have questions later. So I don't want to burden you all. Uh, especially since so if I could at least address the one point, obviously, fire services director. Um, one of the issues we talked about was volunteers, what have you. Um, that is a component of it. But, you know, I will tell you, I'm familiar, for example, that there are companies that that have more volunteers than we do. And that their the problems are when those volunteers were available, as an example. Mm -hmm. And and increasingly, a vol the volunteer company's capability of, of handling the scope of what needs to be addressed from regional cooperation and and capital purchases and how that meshes with other departments. And you know, in our in our town, we have we have several hundred annual commercial fire inspections we have we have a volunteer uh and, and, and a part-timer that look at the the components of fire safety with development plans from big ones to small ones so in the end while volunteer is a part of it and the shortfall of volunteers is a part of it for me the recommendation comes about that the scope of it is becoming bigger and bigger not just because of volunteers and because this is ultimately our responsibility the board having essentially um, a, a someone who facilitates and liaisons with those things to, to help the board make informed decisions or that sort of scopes out problems that are coming before they become problems is sort of, and, and there's technical requirements for the job that you can see in the job description. But in the end, there's always sort of been this gap of communication between what's happening, um, what's happening and what's needed and what the board and the town is aware of. So part of my, approach to this is that person would help um, would help bridge that gap and be available to the board to report to coordinate with the emergency management coordinator on instant on in, on incidents um, and to have a good positive working relationship with the volunteer company which would be needed so um, certainly any questions that come in that regard with anything I'm, I'm happy to address as specifically as I can sure and just one last final comment I don't want to take up all the question time but um, in general, I'm pleased that with respect to the proceeds and the review of the, the golf uh, situation, the repayment of the capital, or pardon me, the operational fund re removal for the last couple of years is something I've been long suggested that needed to be done for transparency. And I think on a go forward basis, this is a way of accounting for the golf debt going forward. And I know even post this transaction, we'll still have significant well actually relatively insignificant it'd be what seven million post at 7.4 yeah so um i'm happy that that at least is being called out and yep. so that we're not just sort of oh we now have uh, everything's perfect with a golf course and, and that sort of stuff john i'd like to add one more thing that you brought up to me okay and this would be a decision of the board if in fact this gets approved in some fashion or form, that golf bond repayment fund could also be set up in such a way that that is put in, for example, a type of irrevocable trust that could not then be spent on something else if that was the board's desire. But the plan would be in that fund that every year that is tracked. And granted, it's a $50,000 line item now, but that would continue to appear in the budget where that number was tracked and boards and future boards could see where that outstanding balance sits. So that's never lost track of. 
and presumably once we get past that first uh, repayment of the operating or, or I mean a general fund subsidies, we could ratchet that 50,000 to reflect what the bond. You, you, and the board could decide if you want to do the entire additional 400 in there, or like I said before, um, um, like I said before, or as an example, you'd have flexibility that if you had some sort of park project, trail project, that you, you wanted to have extra come out of the golf course to go and fund something like that because there's a big grant available or you have matching money, you have a lot of flexible options in there to use those proceeds, um, use those proceeds to fund future projects um, out of that, uh, uh, those user fees. Yeah, but my main concern though, and, and, and well, as many folks know, I'm, I was not, uh, I'm still opposed to it. Sewer sale, I want a situation where we have a um, general fund uh, is such that we have a fortress around it that we would never ever have to consider and earn income tax ever. Um, so my thoughts are that, well, I know folks like a lot of spending and I don't want to be in a situation like the lottery winner, winner who goes bankrupt after a couple of years and now is starting to say, well, where do I get additional revenue? So I, my main concern is how do we make sure that general fund is never in a state where we have to worry about mm -hmm. implementing an earned income tax. John, quite frankly, I didn't say this. An, an option the board would always have with those positive proceeds would be to make the decision even after the money is repaid, the 400,000 a year, there's nothing stopping you from earmarking a certain money from amount of money from the golf course, the positive cash flow in the golf course directly to the general fund, even if it's undesignated to pay for things. If we have a, a financial downturn or something of that sort that the general fund needs an influx of cash, those all those possibilities are there. I yield back the balance of my time. It's your turn, Dan. You get the balance of John's time. How do they say it in the Senate? The, the gentleman from uh, the North, North Three or whatever, you, wherever you're from, John. Um, thanks, Kurt, for in, and Monica and everyone else that put this together. Uh, stepping back to, to process, Kurt. I I don't I don't know that we touched on it, but it's I think for myself and folks at home. Today is sort of our first presentation of the draft budget. Um, now, you know, the, can can you just walk us through briefly the the steps in the process in terms of when we have to vote on something, when it, you know, and publish it and all that, all that other uh, good stuff. Sure. So, uh, um, I'll talk around two points: the existing meeting schedule that we have um, as the baseline. If you follow the existing meeting schedule that we have. The next meeting, which is November 17th, two weeks from tonight, the board could consider a preliminary budget. That preliminary budget, so bear with me, I'll keep talking. That preliminary budget would be essentially um, with it creating certain legal requirements in terms of how much you can change in that budget. Once you pass a preliminary budget, that budget needs to go on display for 20 days. Um, then could be passed as a final budget at your December 15th meeting. Um, again, once you pass a preliminary budget, you have certain restrictions on the level of changes that you make. If you decided after you passed a preliminary budget that you wanted to make changes that exceeded the legal requirements, you'd have to start over again. You'd have to pass another preliminary budget posted for 20 days and what have you. So in the end, um, the board could always hold additional meetings prior to a preliminary approval or, or hold a, an additional meeting after the 17th. Um, again, you have that 20 day window. So if you were going to stick with December 15th, which is the final meeting um, of the year, scheduled meeting of the year, you would have to pass your preliminary budget at least 20 days before that, which would be something like November 27th, 26th, something like that. Well, yeah, but you, we can, you can have the advertisement reset that it appears the very next day in advance. So, so in the end, it, you know, if you don't want to pass a preliminary budget on November 17th, you would have to pass one somewhere around a week or so after that to not have to hold a meeting after the 15th. 
you could always hold a meeting after the 15th, but the process requires, the reason I like this process is you're under no legal requirements to do. You can make any changes of any scope that you want leading into the preliminary budget. But the main point about the preliminary budget is after you pass it, you have to have it out there in public for a minimum of 20 days available for review before you pass it as a final uh, final budget. Thanks, Kurt. That's a helpful reminder. And I, um, yeah, I don't, you know, we're not getting into a lot of questions tonight because I think we're, there's a lot to, you know, the proverbial drinking from the fire hose, no pun intended, given some of the stuff we're talking about tonight with all the information. Um, I pers I don't know what my fellow supervisors, uh, how they're feeling, but I personally uh, found the budget workshops that we had in past years um, to go through in a, not as formal a setting per se, but going through line by line, and just really digging into the, the line items was very helpful in years past. And I, I, I would be in, in favor of having one of those meetings this year prior to passing something. If, if, fellow board members were interested. Um, we can, something we discuss separately if we like, but um, no, generally, I guess, um, I think there's some really, really interesting things going on. I like the restructuring of, of the, the pool items. I like the fact that the pool is uh, pretty much self-preserving. <laughs> I, I like those types of funds. Um, Definitely like paying down debt and getting rid of debt and making the golf course profitable. Um, those are very positive highlights uh, to all of these. I think everyone uh, should appreciate that. Where my, where, where my concern is just, and this is a very high level because I, I really got to dig into to, um, the details to see if there's ways to address it is when we look and we, we know we get and I'm oversimplifying this. I'll say that up front. But when when we look at a you know, a large influx of of funds, you know, fifty million dollars is a very big number, and we're which will also create additional funds because the golf course now turns a profit. So we you know we're making more than fifty million this year, which is a great thing. Um, to see basically have the effect of only I'll say only because it it looks like that up, up front. I'm not trying to lessen it to only see a half mil tax increase um, gives me pause to the to the point where I, I kind of want to step back and dig into some of the details I know Kurt we've had a few good discussions about it prior to this and that's a tax meeting. cut not a tax increase a tax I'm, I'm sorry I, I meant to say cut I, I if I said increase I apologize but I I, I would have anticipated more um, uh, and I would I guess I would have anticipated a bit more in the general fund uh, based off of all that, of course, we there's still money to to work with in the future that we have set aside for future discussions. It sounds like, um, but those are just very uh, high level issues that I know. You know, we're we're spending a lot on roads this year. I, you know, my earlier comment is and it was a comment where you know when you're doing when you're looking at uh, what is 11.4 ish miles of roads just to make sure that we we can feasibly do that without causing problems for ourselves yeah you know, or you know or seven and a half in a few years just to make sure that we when we talk to folk you know contractors that do road programs in a town like lower makefield that uh if we're going to do that that in the rfp process we make sure they have you know bulletproof um, traffic management plans and traffic safety plans to make sure that our, our residents can still go about their day and get to work and pick up their kids from school and buses can get where they need to get to. Um, definitely like seeing the increase. I just want to make sure we're not increasing too much, too much of a good thing, I guess, I'm looking at it. Um, and then the various, uh, various hires. Um, been thinking a lot, uh, just keep thinking about all the various hires and restructuring and um, you know, since we haven't had a lot of discussion behind those these re restructuring plans, I know we had the uh, assistant chief come in a couple times for the first time in a very long time over the summer. Um, I guess that sort of precluded this. I, 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 would, I guess I would have hoped that 
if this was coming, we could have talked about it at that meeting uh, with him to get his feedback as to how we might be able to work. His group may be able to work with that person uh, or other ideas they might have. But the, I, I would very much like to have a, a budget workshop so we could go over all that stuff. Or if supervisors aren't up for that, um, I guess go through the spreadsheet and just mark it up. And I'm not sure when we could discuss that in greater greater detail given given the, the time frame. So just so there's not any confusion, you know, since I, I know in previous years we'd have department heads that would come over. A lot of towns don't do this anymore, but sort of essentially give their wish lists and go over every line item and provide those things. And you know, since I've been here and at least my approach has been to pare down um, wish lists. Um, I say this because she's sitting here. Monica's wish list has somewhere around 350 items on it. And we pare that down to sort of what we can fit into the budget. Um, you know, going over, I mean, if, if, if the board thinks we need to go line by line, um, I'm certainly capable of doing that. Um, you know, some of these lines go without saying, you know, we have a social security, you know, uh, match in each of these things. We have, you know, I provide the overviews. Um, a lot of the um, a lot of the supplements that we have get into some of those details, particularly those things that become convoluted, like contracted services and insurances and things. So, but um, I'm happy. And in the meantime, until we meet again, if anyone has questions that they want me to be prepped for in that next meeting, you can certainly email me and I'll do my very best to be fully prepared to address specifically what those concerns or, or questions, uh, specifics uh, may be. You, you said, I, I'm not sure, Fred, if you said earlier that you had no comments at the time or do you have no comments tonight? I, I have comments. Oh, did, so maybe, I'm sorry, Dan, are you done? I thought you were done, but if you're not done. No, I, I guess my, I don't know if this is a question for the board to discuss. If, if Is there any interest in, from the fellow board members to have a budget workshop? I, I, I'm not, I, James, I don't think you've been, I don't think you've been able to take part in one because I'm not sure we had one. Suzanne, I think I can't no, remember to be we honest. We haven't had, yeah. So I've been here 18, 19, 20, and 21, yeah. and we've not had them other than I think maybe when Kurt first started as he was trying to get his feet under the ground, we might have had a more prolonged process, but we've not. I'm confused by these budget workshops that you and John both have mentioned since you and I have been on the board the same amount of time, Dan, and we've not had one, but. I'm not interested in one at this point. If uh, over the next few weeks, if something changes, then I would consider it. But for now, I, I'm not interested, but I'm just one. I, I will point out though, into the preliminary budget on the next agenda, if the budget meeting stayed the same as part of the preliminary approval, we can go, obviously it's, I don't think there's gonna be a motion on the agenda where we make a motion to approve. I'm sure there's gonna be detailed questions, this document you've had for a week or so, right. that we can go into much as much depth uh, as you'd like. I'll have department heads available to answer questions. Obviously the chief is, he's always here. And uh, we can sit and get into any specifics um, that the board deems necessary to cover. So if Dan is done, then Fred wants to go. But if Dan's not done, then Dan should finish. Then Fred will go. And then John, if you need to go again, you can go again. So Dan, yeah, no, are you done? I'm all done. Fred, can't, Fred Okay. Thank you. Go. Thank you, Dan. Fred, do you want to go? You... I'll let John do. Okay. John? Yeah. In general, <laughs> uh, I found the workshops to be helpful and detailed. And, and so sometimes when there's a desire by board members to make adjustments or work through things, or at least better understand them. The workshop environment allowed supervisors and department heads and township administration to review things. In most cases, it was to understand the value of a certain decision. And so I would be open to that um, as well. Could that be done on the November uh, 17th meeting? It, it, it certainly could. It would probably take up the, the one challenge I have is if there were significant discussion and we had to follow up with some additional analysis, that might be a challenge. So that's my concern in terms of timing. And so I would agree with the, uh, Supervisor Grenier on that because I just think 
um, it would be a better, a more comfortable process, and at least we would feel more uh, that we had understood more of the budget. Um, however, if the, the chair doesn't feel that that's a value, uh, we could certainly schedule a non-public one-on-one -on -one workshops. The challenge I have with that is there's a benefit to discussing some of the items here and working through them. So those are my thoughts on that. Fred, did you want to say anything? Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, I, I'd like to thank Kurt and the staff for a yeoman's job in creating this 2022 budget. Uh, in my own opinion, I think this is a transformational happening. Going from um, where the heck are we going to get money to what are we going to do now that we're out of debt and that we find ourselves in a, in a situation where we formed a structure where we can basically self fund for years to come, uh, negating the need for an EIT or going to court to raise millage time and time again. And I, I just find it exciting that we're in this position now that we can move forward uh, with strength instead of in weakness, and I appreciate all the efforts of the township manager and his department heads and the staff. I applaud your efforts because I know it took many, many hundreds of hours over a long period of time to get to this day. That being said, and I don't see a need for a budget workshop once everybody has put in so much time and effort to create this budget, this recommended budget. I would consider a special meeting so that we can go through the budget prior to approving it or, or changing it, um, you know, uh, so that we can devote the meeting for that purpose. But a workshop, I don't see the, the need. Um, as you can see, it's already 10 of 10. And we're just asking questions. We're not even considering a, approval or, or breaking it apart. We've seen the budget. We know what it's about. And I don't really have an interest in, in determining whether we buy five police cars or four police cars or hiring a full-time administrative assistant or a secretary. I don't, I, that's something you, that the, st the staff has all come to agreement of to get us forward. So at this point, um, I'm happy to discuss the, the issue of the budget, the details of the budget, but I'm, I'm not willing to have a workshop where we tear it apart and rebuild the budget. And I, I appreciate my professionals and the effort, and I also appreciate the need for the board to put the stamp of approval on it and make policy adjustments but as far as the line items are concerned, I don't, I don't think a, a workshop is needed. Thank you. If there's nothing further, then I would open it up to public comment. So uh, we do have public comment in the room. Anyone who wants to guess? Please state your name and address. Lee Pedowitz, 247 Truman Way, Yardley. Uh, I've got a bunch of questions, but I'll send an email to Kurt so it don't take up more time. Is there any way this discussion we've had, it's been over an hour, could be at a separate meeting? I mean, I'm not saying a workshop, but we've uh, been kicking this around for over an hour. I mean, I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there because I think we have a lot of other stuff on the agenda. The, as, as was outlined, Kurt has presented his version of the budget. It will be discussed again at the next supervisor's meeting and perhaps voted upon so that it'll be published and there'll still be more time to talk about it. So but, we've not had a separate meeting in the past. I don't understand right now where I sit. I don't, I don't feel the need for a separate meeting. So is it possible? It's totally possible. Is it necessary? Right now, I don't understand why it would be necessary. Well, I would welcome I, any questions you have to me, to anybody, or to Kurt. 
Okay, well, I'll send them to Kurt, but I think Kurt mentioned once you get to that preliminary plateau, then it becomes a real uh, nuisance if there are major changes to it. So I thought this meeting like this, you know, I've got some con concerns and uh, there are probably other people. And instead of spending an hour and a half tonight, spend an hour and a half some other night start at eight o'clock or something. You know, I'm just throwing that out there. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Is there any public comment on the line? Yes, we do. We have Brian on the line. I'll bring him in right now. Perfect. Thank you. Brian is in the room. Am I on? Brian, if you could please state your full name and your address for the record. Brian McNamara, Heather Circle. Good Hi, I'm just surprised there's no pushback on the six new hires, especially a full-time pool manager and a full-time assistant. What are they, they going to do when the pool is closed? Is number one, I haven't heard anything about salaries or what the total cost of these new hires is going to be. Um, I would think that would mend for needing a, a workshop so that the public can hear this. Because um, going to Fred's comments of being in a positive place because of selling the sewer system, well, the burden still falls on the taxpayers, whether I'm paying the sewer, a private sewer company now, or the township. It might feel great that you got a pot of money to play with, but it's, the burden still falls on the taxpayers, ultimately. But are we talking, do we have a, an idea of what these new salaries are going to cost? Why do we need another planner since we're 98% built out? what new plans are coming down the road that we possibly need in our planner and, and why do we need pool people in the winter time when i was started on park and rec we had one part-time employee one part-time employee that was it that was that was it and then was there was the board by the time i left we had two full times and one part-time now we're telling me you need four full-time park and rec employees and a part-time employee this 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 sounds insane, this kind of hiring, and it does sound like now you got a pool of money and, hey, why don't we just keep on hiring people? On top of all the other hires that have happened, you know, since Kirk's been the manager, I just I think it's crazy. I think the workshop is needed so people can go through this. And, and if there is a need, then we can see that. But I just, just come in this and not hear anybody push back on this. It, it's just, honestly, it's, it's disheartening that nobody's even pushing back on these hires. I mean, what does a full 12 month pool manager do in the winter? And why do we need one? We never need one before. I'm, I'm happy. Thank you, thank you, Brian. Kurt's uh, gonna answer your question. I'm happy to answer all those questions. So um, first, um, a planner doesn't just do plans like Wegmans or large projects. Planners, we've done 20, we'll do 2,300 permits this year. We have, sewer lateral permits that we have that will that will for every property that sells that'll probably number 800 this year we have zoning permits we have smaller projects in the end um, it's for a town of our size it's one of the smaller planning departments that you'll ever see so we'll start with that so a planner Essentially, um, you know, you have other departments of similar size that'll have a community development director, a planner, two code enforcement. You know, we have one code enforcement officer that's dealing with the complaints across the township. So in the end, it's meant to not be in excess, but to shore up that department so we can meet the needs of the township. In regards to the pool manager, as I had mentioned during my presentation, one, um, it is getting increasingly difficult to fill these positions part-time pool managers they don't they are not readily available hiring them is difficult keeping them is even harder so a lot of places that have full-time pool managers that have had them as part-time positions as we have when those persons when they get fortunate enough to keep them for a long period of time and they leave we're increasingly not seeing those types of people qualified people available because most of them are going down south so in the end the pool season essentially starts essentially in February with advertising and hiring and background checks and prep 
um, coordination with chemicals, with everything that we need and runs to, let's say, a month or so after Labor Day, that person could be available for other items like programming and other things that we have in the township. The other thing I would point out is, in the end, to create a competitive salary of, let's say, $20 or so an hour for a pool manager, um, our pool manager this year, for example, at times was averaging over 90 hours a week. So when we're paying people over time and what have you to do that, the cost for a pool, a full-time pool manager that would come with benefits is not far different than what we're paying now and having to deal with the transient nature of the position. So in the end, and frankly, I'll, I'll just address the other thing if we could, uh, in regards to hires, um, you know, since I've been here, we have made a hire or two. We hired a laborer um, in the public works department. Um, we've done some police hires to get to capacity that the chief has actually held off on for quite some time. Townships of our size, frankly, we don't have many of the positions that would be expected and frankly, probably typically needed in the township. So, for example, we don't have a planner. We have a small staff. We don't have an assistant public works director to assist with projects. We don't have a finance director or a human resources director or an assistant manager or a special project coordinator. I just say those jobs because those are all jobs that I do when my counterparts in Northampton and some of these other places all have positions for that. So my recommendations for staffing this year, frankly, were not to benefit myself from my own workload with any of those positions. It were to benefit the shortfalls that we're seeing in other departments and gaps that we're seeing um, that I felt were uh, a necessity. The positions like to assist myself um, are, are not a necessity. I will continue to handle those positions and work when I work, but the other positions when we start to see that there's a gap in service of what the physical capabilities of staff are to provide them and the demands of the township were what led to those recommendations that were before you. But in the answer to the final question, in the end, we have been budgeting um, about $30,000 or so a year for a part-time pool manager, typically paying more than that with overtime. As I had mentioned, the pay for a pool manager would be essentially in the low 50s to be year-round, to be a management-exempt employee without getting um, overtime because they would be in a management position. So in the end, the numbers sort of level out compared to what it is as a part-time position. Thank you. Thank you for the explanation. And I would just say then, I would think maybe the workshop would be beneficial, especially for the public if they come in and watch this and if those numbers prove out, then they, you know, not to leave and, you know, to be totally transparent to the public when you talk about hiring 6 million employees, that's a lot, especially when, again, when Park and Rec, when I was on it, and then that wasn't that long ago, like about four years ago, was a part one part time employee. Now we're talking four and a half employees to do the job that one half time person did. I love Monica. I think bad about that. But I'm saying when you added that many more people on, you know, and then how, how has the township been able to be, and people are going to wonder, how has the township been able to run with the staffing we've had? Okay, Mr. McNamara, uh, Monica questions. would like to address your question. I know it's hard in this virtual hybrid environment to yeah, always see what is. the other thank people you. are saying. So go ahead, Monica. Yes, thank you. So Brian, I'd, I'd love to address what you've said. You've done a great job while you were on the board growing the parks department. Um, you've added development, added facilities, um, which in turn requires a lot more work and a lot more effort. Um, I would recommend that you go to the Parks and Recreation Department website and look at the 2020-2021 annual report that I uh, put on the website so you can see exactly what our department is doing and exactly why we need assistance and help. Um, I think Kurt did a great job addressing why we need a full-time year-round uh, pool manager because there's so much hiring and paperwork and human resources involved with the hiring process, interviewing all year long are things we're doing in preparation for that. Every year is a new year, background checks, making sure that the um, employees are educated and trained in the way that they need to in advance of the year. 
So um, I, I would really like, and I would be glad to talk to you about the needs of the department uh, moving forward into the new years. Thank you, Monica, and thank I you, Brian, love, for calling. I, I would love that, yes, thank you. Okay, have a great night. Yeah. Thank Is you, there any... one more thing. Yeah, Monica, you sound like you're breathing heavy there. You're oh, more six feet away from anybody. Put your mask down. I, I, I just don't mask. Put, you're gasping there. I would love <laughs> to do all that. I just, I think it, the workshop would be help be transparent to everybody. I'm not saying it's got to be, you know, it's the wrong approach, but we're ramping oh, up. Is Brian, I don't know if you've lot, had a chance to go to the website. The budget is there. It's a searchable document. Yeah. Um, it's been there. So please, I would ask you to take advantage of that. And thanks again for calling that's, in. That's the budget. I'm talking about the extra employees needed. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any more public comment? No public comment. Okay. All right. Well, more to come. And with that, uh, thank you, Monica. Uh, we are on to the agenda item number 12 with the solicitor's report. Yes, briefly, the uh, board met in executive session tonight. All board members are present along with uh, my partner, Barbara Kirk. Mr. Ferguson, uh, Chief Kaluzzi, and myself, items related to litigation, personnel, and collective bargaining were discussed at the, at the executive session, which concluded at about 7.20 this evening, right before this meeting started. There are no zoning hearing board applications on the agenda this month, which is this week, which is unusual, but um, that's, uh, I guess we've taken a hiatus from, from some of the, the pool applications. Um, next is uh, the approval, consider approval of the minor subdivision for 1181 Oxford Valley Road, LLC, plan number 684. I don't know if Mr. Young and or Mr. McGrath are going to participate. Oh, there we go. Oh, this whole time I wondered who the two gentlemen out in the lobby were. <laughs> so while they're getting set up uh, so we can keep the uh, things moving, and, um, this is a property located at 1181 Oxford Valley Road to orient everybody to that. It's, uh, we talked about the community center tonight. This is across the street from the community center, just slightly south and west. It's on the other side of the road. Obviously, there's a long driveway to a home that's uh, at that location. Uh, the proposed plan uh, proposes to subdivide an existing lot into two lots and to construct a single family dwelling on the new lot. The existing dwelling will be on the newly created flag lot. There's also proposed to be stormwater management, grading, erosion control, and the flag lot driveway connection to Oxford Valley Road. Uh, and I think that lead in was just enough to give Mr. Young some time to set up. Young, if you want to use that microphone there too, because that's this is the meeting's being recorded and also it's being televised. So in order to have uh, adequate acoustics, we need to have you speaking to the mic. Hopefully it's working. So um, and I do have a, I didn't actually send you that, but I have a proposed approval letter. But before I get into that, if you want to just give a little introduction about the project, you've obviously got uh, rendering and Mr. McGrath is here as well, the developer to answer any questions as well. So yeah, sure. far, far away. I'm Larry Young, Tri-State Engineers. Um, this property is- Mr. Young, I, I, I can hear you perfectly well, but for the TV to hear you, you have to bring the mic right to you. Okay. Yep, thank you. Name's Larry Young with Tri-State Engineers. Um, the property is located at 1181 Oxford Valley Road. It's uh, 3.4 acres. Um, the proposal is to um, create a building lot, uh, subdivide the lot into two lots. One lot, which is a flag lot, contains the existing farmhouse, the barn, and the uh, a smaller house on it and the lot up front is um, the proposed building lot. Uh, it's in the R2 zoning district. Um, lot, two, lot two will be uh, connected to water and sewer. Um, also lot, lot one we are also going to hook to sewer um, based on your ordinance. Um, We've uh, went to the planning commission. They uh, recommended approval. Um, the, the waivers that we're asking for are, uh, there's four waivers. Um, one is to use a shared driveway for the first 95 feet 
Um, that's right where this proposed driveway. So this, this portion of the driveway will be shared by both property owners. Beyond that driveway, it's only, it belongs to lot, lot one back here. Uh, there will be an access easement agreement uh, that calls out the maintenance responsibilities between the two owners. Um, the other uh, uh, waiver that we're requesting is for lot lines, side lot lines, not to be 90 degrees to the street. Basically, it's this flag portion of the lot. We're just following the lot line that uh, is already there, and the driveway falls within that lane. Um, so we're asking for a waiver for that. Um, number three, at the Planning Commission, it was discussed that we may not even need this waiver because there's adequate trees along the frontage. Your ordinance would call for seven trees along that, that length of frontage, but because there's existing trees all along the frontage, um, we may not need that waiver, but if we do, we would request it. Um, and the, the fourth and final waiver is um, submitting all the plan sets, the 25 plan sets. We only submitted four to, to not take down more trees for the submission. So um, other than that, we've received um, some review letters, which we really don't have any, um, uh, you know, we, we will comply with the letters. We have the Remington Vernick letter, your engineer's letter. Um, it dated July, June 23rd, 2021. Uh, we have your fire chief letter who says he approves the plan as, it, as is. We have the July 6th, uh, 2021 traffic engineer review letter which basically just says that there's an, a traffic impact fee, which the, uh, you know, will, will, my client will, will uh, contribute the amount called out in that document. Uh, we do have an adequate letter from the Bucks County Conservation District. We'll, 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 um, we'll probably have to resubmit once the revisions get done to address these letters. Nothing major is changing. Um, the, we have two reviews by your sewer engineer. One originally was done in August 16th, 2021, and a subsequent letter was dated uh, November 2nd, 2021. That was a review on the easement. Uh, my, my client, John McGrath, had to, um, there, there's no sewer in Oxford Valley Road um, in that area. So uh, John um, kind of went to a few of the residents to see who would give him access through their lot to the sewer that's either in, I think it's Countess Way and Victory Drive. Um, uh, they're, they're near that location. Yeah, so the third lot in, um, John was able to secure a 10 foot wide easement um, kind of the property owner was resistant about any bigger easement, but subsequently John went back to the, the, uh, property owner and, uh, acquired the 20 foot as, uh, recommended in, uh, Mr. Evers letter. So all, all of the conditions in these letters, um, you know, we'll comply with. And there are no outstanding zoning issues. I, what I will do is if uh, I can either read the letter in as a motion or if there's if there are, uh, questions first for the developer before I do that, that's fine. Whatever uh, the board's wishes. I mean, I think we should go with the motion All right. just to, yeah, you know, I, I, I always ruin that protocol. Letter. We might as well try to. <laughs> I won't read the entire letter, but I'll read at least the salient parts. Mr. Young and I combined have I think covered a lot of the background uh, material. Um, 
Okay, and if the board, the motion will be to approve the plan subject to specific compliance with the following terms and the plan is all the documents that uh, Mr. Young has uh, referred to and there are also a couple other mentioned in the uh, overview or the uh, approval letter, draft approval letter. So the compliance with the following terms, number one, if required, you must obtain beyond appeal all necessary and or required variances from the zoning ordinance or in the, in the alternative, you must revise the plan so it is fully compliant with the zoning ordinance, number two. In addition to the foregoing, you shall comply with the requirements set forth in the letter dated June 23rd, 2021, prepared by the Township's Engineering Consultant, Remington and Vernick Engineers, and any supplements the same. Number three, you shall comply with all requirements and determinations of the Township's sewer engineer regarding the proposed sanitary sewer facilities, including but not limited to all requirements and conditions as more fully set forth in the review letters dated August 16th, 2021, and November 2nd, 21, uh, issued by Ebert Engineering, Inc., uh, excuse me, shall comply with all requirements and determinations of the township's traffic engineer, including not limited to all requirements and conditions as more fully set forth in the review letter as indicated by Mr. Young, dated July 6, 2021, issued by Safe Highway Engineering, LLC. Yes, you shall comply with all requirements and determinations of the Yardley Makerville Fire Company, including but not limited to all requirements and conditions as more fully set forth in the review letter, dated July 9, 2021. Next, you shall comply with all requirements and determinations of the Lower Makefield Township Planning Commission, including but not limited to all requirements and conditions as fully set forth in the review memo dated August 19th, 2021. Next, you shall comply with all requirements and determinations of the Bucks County Planning Commission, including but not limited to all requirements and conditions set more fully set forth in their review letter and memo dated July 14th, 2021. Uh, next, uh, compliance with all Bucks County Conservation District review letter requirements in that letter dated, and I don't have the letter in my file right here, but I will certainly obtain that. It was mentioned by Mr. Young. Uh, next, if applicable, you must obtain any and all necessary approvals from any and all other applicable governmental entities having jurisdiction over this project, including but not limited to the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. And if uh, applicable, the Lower Makefield Township uh, Environmental Advisory Council. You must uh, you shall pay all required fees as applicable and as set forth in the or, or applicable ordinances unless otherwise noted and as determined by the township prior to the recording of the final plan. In addition to the foregoing as requested, the township board of supervisors, if it's approved in this motion, has granted waivers from the following requirements of the ordinance as indicated by Mr. Young, number one, a waiver from the uh, applicable ordinance regarding the uh, submission of plans as indicated by Mr. Young. Instead of the required 25, it would be four full-size plans and five half-scale plans. The second waiver, the waiver from um, the section of the ordinance to permit a shared driveway for, the, for 95 feet. Next, waiver from uh, another section of the ordinance to permit a side lot line that is not perpendicular to the street line. The proposed side lot line is parallel to the existing boundary line, which is not perpendicular to the street line. That was what Mr. Young also indicated a few minutes ago. Final requ requested waiver would be uh, the, the street tree uh, requirement waiver from section 178-81 point capital B1C to not provide additional street trees along the street frontage. Several <coughs> trees would be required, but as he indicated, there are 10 trees that will remain along the street frontage. So this waiver may actually not be applicable, but they're requesting it in the event that it is. So finally, uh, and this is to the applicant and to Mr. Young as his representative, is your responsibility to incorporate the items in this letter into your final record plan, which will be executed and recorded after it has been reviewed by the township engineer and all other appropriate, appro excuse me, appropriate professionals. All requirements mentioned in this letter were agreed to by the, it, you, you at the meeting of the Lower Mayfield Township Board of Supervisors held on November 5th, 2021. So Mr. Young, if that's the motion made by the township, will you agree to uh, the conditions set forth in the, uh, the letter? You and Mr. McGrath. Okay, thank you. So if uh, one of the board members wants to make that motion, incorporate in the letter. So moved. Thank you, Fred. Is there a second? I just have a question about that, Dave. Does it have to be exactly what's on there or is there is there room for negotiation, specifically the tree ordinance question? Well, yeah, the way, the way it's being done, right? Well, I guess before we discuss it, somebody second it just so we can discuss it and then we can- Sure. All right, I'll second it just so we can Thank discuss you. it. Thank you, uh, the answer to that, Mr. McCartney, is, uh, is it's a good one, is kind of exactly what Mr. Young said. It may not be necessary to have the waiver because if they maintain the 10 street, uh, trees along the frontage, it may not be applicable. I think uh, if I'm reading between the lines, it depends on what happens in the field as, as, uh, as things move forward, but they, they will have to at least maintain uh, 
that, that this, the uh, seven are required, 10 are there now. So that, that, that's the yeah, waiver. There, there's no grading um, in that area at all, other than there's a water service line going out to Ox Valley Road. And that's, you know, a very small line. So it's highly unlikely from what I hear that it's going to be applicable. In fact, they already exceed the number of uh, uh, trees along the street frontage. But I just, I think that's just a, a, fail, a fallback position in the event that something unusual would uh, occur down the road. But I guess that, that, hopefully that answers your question. I don't know if that does. Well, yeah, I was just going to say in favor of the township, I would, I would prefer if the applicant withdrew that request then. Yeah, I, I have to say that I'm I'm also confused by it because I get it that they're there now, but if something should happen. Sure. Well, then if that case, would you agree to withdraw that waiver request? We'll withdraw it. Okay. That Thank you. Easily done. There you go. So you're down to Perfect. four waivers then. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Uh, any other questions from Supervisor? I know Mr. Grenier, I think, I think you had your hand up. So I want to make And just before you say that, I'd like to want everyone to know that the EAC had no comments. Thank so. you. I didn't see that, but I was looking for that. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Dan. Um, actually, James, it was a good segue. Um, I noticed in the planning commission, Bucks County planning commission letter, um, I didn't, I didn't see it in other places, but the Bucks County planning commission letter called out that you were, please correct me if I misread this here. You were, you're going to preserve some, I'm missing it again, something like 1.3 plus acres of, of woodlands on site. Is that correct? Yeah, there, there's many, there's many trees throughout the site. Um, obviously, all the construction is going to be in the front of the site. Um, where we are um, going to do a tree inventory out there. There's a lot of dead trees with ash borer disease, so we're going to document which trees are dead and. Um, if replacement trees are required under your ordinance, we will put the replacement trees on the property. Right. My, my, I, I appreciate that. My, my, uh, my question was specific to our, you know, we have, we have different tree ordinances in, in or make, um, and one of them is woodland specific. So woodlands have a specific definition, right? Whether mm -hmm. a quarter acre of six inch DBH trees, or I think it's 10, uh, 10 DBH trees in an area, dictates that it's a woodlands so the way i read the bucks county planning commission letters that there would be woodlands uh mapped on the plan somewhere on the site that would not be disturbed in the future not not a it wouldn't be a tree replacement thing you just wouldn't touch them you know there's certain areas yeah. of the site that would not be woodlands that you could you would address the tree removal and it, it, and for, for, you know, I'm so i'm sorry go ahead dan i'm sorry no no so that that's i just wanted to distinguish between the two because i didn't on the plans that I'm seeing, because they're they're on my little computer here, um, I didn't see the woodlands delineated on the plans. So, I was, and it seemed like that was a condition of the BCPC letter. I, it is, it's thank a, you, Mr. Rajewski. Number three, but Jim obviously has an observation. Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, yeah, for the most part, uh, the woodlands are not greater than a quarter acre. They're mainly isolated trees. They don't constitute woodlands necessarily under ordinance, either due to the fact that they're there's space in between them or they don't meet the quarter acre area overall. Okay. It's, so I, I think that would be a condition. And if, if it seems like the, there's a condition in the BCPC letter from July 14th of this year that has them calling out the requirement to highlight where the woodland, locate the woodlands on site and, and call them out as not being able to be developed in the, in the future. Um, so, um, I just want to make sure that is a little bit in, I, the way I, I hear that, what you're saying, Jim, is that that might be inconsistent with, with how you or, or someone else has evaluated the actual site. So I just want to make sure that's, that's clear as to what they actually have to do with that part of the site. Does that, does that make sense to people? It would make, well, I think, uh, what would, I would uh, interpret it as being, if indeed that part of the saldo is applicable, they must comply with that part of the, 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 the uh, Bucks County Planning Commission uh, requirement, which we've already read into the record. Before mm -hmm. Mr. Majewski said it may or may not, it may not be uh, applicable. So I guess it's something more in the there, field. There are breaks in the canopy out there. Um, a lot of times, I don't think Bucks County goes out to 
each and every site. So I think I think it's actually kind of rare that they do, to be honest with you. Yeah. Okay. So. And then in terms of the approach to stormwater management, um, I don't know if if uh, if you could describe that briefly as to what your approach is going to be. There there are two two areas. Um, they're kind of rectangular and shape, square and rectangular. There's one on the front, uh, the low side of the house towards the front, and there's one in the back where a swale, uh, this is where everything drains to. So the systems were designed to infiltrate into the soil, um, uh, and the soil testing was, um, uh, was done, performed, and adequate infiltration rates were obtained. So it's just dry, it's basically dry wells. And you all do, okay. the downspouts will be hooked up. And if there's any overland flow, they'll be flowing in a swale to the few yard drains that we put in. Okay. Andy, are you okay with the design as is? Yeah, uh, in our comment review letter, we asked for a calculation to make sure that it uh, the, the proposed systems uh, drain uh, between 24 and 72 hours as required. Um, that, you know, it, if it's a little, if it's a little longer then there you have adequate room on the property to expand the footprint and make the, the basin a little more shallow so that they could achieve that uh, drain rate. So um, I don't see that as uh, uh, an impediment to um, to holding this up. Okay. No, I just want, and then my last question, because I was trying to do a street view on, on Google Earth, and it's, I don't think it's put me in quite the right spot here, but um, is there a sidewalk issue here at all? From, from the there, plans, it didn't, I can't there, tell from the. There's an existing sidewalk along the front of the property. Nothing's perfect. going to change along the front of the property. The driveway is going to be shared, it's already there. Um, the one tree, was dead, it was removed, a real large tree that was dead and was blocking site distance. Um, so that was taken down because of a fall hazard. So this is Good. this is going to be across from the community center and the softball fields. And there's a sidewalk that goes from Victory all in front of this property all the way down to roll offs and around that way. So it's, it's yeah, exactly. okay. So that's where that's where I'm looking now. I see a white house with a white with a white PVC fence uh, at Victory in Oxford Valley. So uh, I can see the sidewalk. I just want to make sure that's yeah. where it's supposed to be. Um, no, so that's all good stuff. So I don't have any uh, any any further comments on this one. Thanks. Any other supervisors? Yes, um, and I'm having a hard time remembering because I'm working on very little sleep. But was this before the zoning hearing board previously? Now. Is there another parcel that you may be thinking of the Gomez one that's down? It's on Oxford Valley, down uh, on the other side of Stony Hill. Um, that also has two houses. Yes, okay. that was a, that was a subdivision of that. That had, that had other more significant issues. I would say, and that's still being yes. being reviewed. Okay, yes, absolutely. So that I have a subdivision. Before. It's uh, sometimes I mix it so that, but on the same road, but just a little further down the road. And so, uh, tell me again what the properties will be when they're built in this case it, it's well the the it's going to be a minor subdivision the front lot is the building lot the where the proposed house will go it's a little over an acre of area in that lot okay. the remaining 3.4 acres will contain the existing farmhouse the barn and the smaller house that's already there and the occupant of that stays there, that sort of stuff. Nothing changes with that. Well, Ms. Mr. McGrath and his partner own that, that, and that's going to remain. Nothing's going to be done on lot, um, lot one, except that they're going to be connected to sewer. Okay. Sewer. Okay. Yeah, I'm okay. I mean, I apologize for because I was mixing the two up, and it's a very similar kind of structure. So I'm like. Because there were a lot of questions with that mm -hmm. one and uh, impervious surface, so I'm okay here if you're meeting all those requirements. So, anyone else? Any public comment? 
Hearing none, call the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. 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 Thank you. The motion passes 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Young, I will fix up, finalize this letter, email it to you probably next day or two. Okay. And Mr. McGrath, all right? Yep. Okay. Um, with that, we are on to agenda item number 15 public comment. We have public comment here in the room. Please state your full name and address for the record. Lee Pedowitz, 247 Truman Way in Yardley. Well, the first comment I have is, I think, well, I'm hoping Hardis is not up to their old tricks. Uh, the reason I say that is because five o'clock in the morning this past Monday, they, I was woken up by a truck's backup alarm. And unfortunately, the loading dock is right behind my house. So I was just going to ask the board, if it happens again, what should I do? Get out of my nice warm bed and take a picture? Should I call the police? What, what, what should I do? Because I just don't want them to start. If it happens again, I'm going to do something. I just want to know what to do. So, so uh, one, obviously, if it becomes a recurrent problem, we've had issues where I would sign the um, code enforcement officer to, and even the planning director to be out early when, when those would be reported. If you can see something and you want to snap a picture, that always helps because in the end, if we end up having to cite someone and we've done that and given warning letters or even take someone before the magistrate, if we're not direct, you know, we essentially would be, um, it would be hearsay from us. We would have to have someone who, you know, who would be firsthand pictures help. But I'd suggest in the end, if it happens again, call in, let Mr. Majewski know. We could sit and assign someone to be out there uh, to, uh, in advance of the allowable time to start um, to, if that's happening, to be the, to, to catch them directly doing that to, to take care of it. All right. I mean, like I said, it was about five o'clock in the morning. And, and so the, uh, and in the meantime, if you send Mr. Majewski as well, a brief email with the date and time, we can certainly put them on notice that we have gotten complaints and to remind them of what their obligations are under the code. That would okay. be typically how we'd start all of that. We'll take literal your time and we will put them on notice that we've had this reported and, and start from there. Okay, John, thank you. And the only other- Mr. Pedowitz, John has something he'd like to add. Mr. Pedowitz, do you have a direct line of sight to that from your backyard? Um, I'm gonna say yes. Okay, so I'll make a suggestion that would cost you a little bit of money, but something that would give you rock solid proof and something that's been helping our police force uh, throughout our Makefield, and there are cameras, ring cameras, that's one brand. There are many other brands of this type. And what they have is motion sensors, and they upload the video to the cloud. Now, there are a lot of public policy issues with the fact that we've all got cameras everywhere now. Uh, but that could address your problem because you would have video proof with the timestamp and on the cloud. So if that was a recurring concern of yours and, and you wanted to have rock solid proof, that's something you could consider. It's relatively low cost. Yeah. Uh, and again, I don't want to endorse any particular brand name and, and there are a whole host of issues, but those types of cameras have helped us in the township. Yeah. Um, I don't mean to interrupt, but I think the problem I'd have with that is I'd have to go through the homeowners association and I think, uh, yeah, they're going to say, what do you do with a camera uh, looking out at your backyard? Um, I don't know. I'd have to, I'll see what I can do. I mean, I could dig up a camera, but I think for, I'll see if it happens again. It's just, I don't want this to be a recurring thing. Like every Monday and Thursday, they're going to have a truck unloading at five o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know that we've had problems with them before. So I just want to bring that up. And my only other comment is, are we going to be discussing that PICO presentation under Dan Grenier's presentation under supervised reports? Because, Dan going to bring up the PICO presentation? Yeah. Dan, are you going to bring up the PICO presentation? I, I would be happy to do so. I was going to ask for an update as part of the supervisor report. Supervisor Blunder, you can... It's up to you where, where you'd like to discuss it, if, if at all. Yeah, I, I understand there's been a request. We are working with the township manager and PICO to understand what we can specifically whittle away and so that we have a meaningful dialogue going forward. 
I do know that Supervisor Weiss has prepared and sent to me, and I did forget until just now, my apologies, a letter for us to consider sending in response to some issues that um, Yardley Hunt has been having. So again, I apologize. Uh, so let me get to that and circulate it and we'll uh, keep moving forward. I can answer one thing to that. So the chair of the reliability committee put a list together or put a letter together for me to forward to Mr. Durant regarding the concerns about outages at, I think it was like October 8th or 9th or 10th, yes. whatever that date was. I spoke to Mr. Durant and we will have um, answers back from Mr. Durant and Pico tomorrow that um, I will make sure that I forward to the committee, your liaison, what have you. I expect it probably mid-morning tomorrow. Okay, will that be brought up at the next board meeting in two weeks or <clears throat> no? Their response? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, just, you know, well, you know, the, the, the reason I bring it up is because Pico's, as you said, is having problems in Yardley Hunt. <clears throat> the reason I think it would be nice to have Pico here, they could explain not from a technical perspective, but what's going on with their system, not only in Yardley Hunt, but elsewhere. And uh, I know uh, we had a momentary outage in my house, uh, I don't know, last week, but that's not considered an outage. I mean, it made all the clocks bl bl blink, but uh, it's not an outage. And I think, you know, maybe if the board had some understanding of what Pico is doing out there, it might be helpful. And so that's it. So I guess uh, I'm done for the evening. <laughs> Thank you very yes, much. Have a nice week. Two weeks. Is there any public comment on the line? No public comment online. Okay, thank you. Uh, agenda item 16, are there any discussion items? Then agenda item uh, 17, this being the third of the month uh, and none of my committees have met, I have nothing to report under supervisor reports. James, how about you? I have nothing to report at this time. Thank you, and Fred? I have nothing to report. Thank you, Fred. John? Uh, yeah, just one quick item. I know the Trenton Mercer uh, Airport Review Board has asked for uh, a potential agenda uh, item slot in a future meeting. And I wanted to know if that had been reviewed at all. Yeah, John, I thought when you had asked, I thought again, but my memory is not so great. Uh, is there an urgency? Because I just I obviously, you know, want to give them time. Um, but because we're in budget mode right now, so like, is there a time frame or something that's kicking around that we need to make sure? I don't want to move it forever into the future, but I just want to be aware of the needs. Their, their sense of urgency is a, a couple fold. One is obviously they, they're actively petitioning uh, Mercer County to do a proper environmental assessment. And they want to keep the community informed so that they know uh, what's happening with the, with the project. Additionally, what's changed too, uh, you know, obviously the concern about PFOS has been something that has uh, increased recently with respect to that project. And I sense from part of their request is coming from that urgency. So again, uh, I had not gotten anything back as to when that was of, of uh, whether a time slot would be available. I'm certainly open to passing back your feedback in any way, shape or form as you would like to, uh, the review board, I can certainly do that. Yeah, I just, I don't know that I was clear, so let me try again. Mm. If, if they need uh, the community to do something by November 20th, then we'll, we'll find time on the next agenda. But if we can move it till not on the same night of the budget and still get them what they need, then that would be my preference. So if you could get, let me know that, we can move forward. I can certainly do that. And that concludes my supervisor's report. Thank you, John. Dan? Yeah, Susan, I'll just, add, I'll just add a question to what you had or some, some advice, I guess, on the airport. John, if you could check to see if there's some op an open public comment period that we need to respond yeah. to or something like that, to, I, to Suzanne's point, um, that would be helpful because that could help direct whatever we might need to think about. Um, that, that's... I'm thinking about it the same way as Suzanne, but someone who mm -hmm. does that work, it's, it's, uh, that's usually the driver. So I'm curious. Um, anyhow, uh, let's see. The only thing I'll say about 
that we haven't said already on the electric reliability committee report uh, is uh, Kurt, when you, I think what might be a good idea uh, when we get PICO's response to the, to the uh, most recent letter you sent them, it, like you said, you're going to, you know, just reinforcing what you just said, I think uh, when we get that to the committee and, and, and myself, um, hopefully the committee will be able to meet not that long after that letters received so they can review it and provide some guidance to the board if, if guidance is, to, is, is necessary. So we could take it up at a, at a future meeting if, if needed. That's, I would hope that's, that's good. Otherwise, um, historic commission is in need of members. I think we may have one, one individual who has expressed an interest. I don't think I've seen a, a resume yet, but they could still use a few more members. So anyone that would be interested in joining the Historic Commission, they, uh, they are a very interesting group. You can learn a lot about the town and have, have, uh, take part in some, some very interesting stuff. Um, I believe they'll be meeting in a few weeks. Uh, they This month they're meeting it in the morning, so please keep an eye out for our calendar when they'll be meeting. Other than that, I don't have anything else to add. Thanks, Susan. Thank you, Dan. Agenda item number 18, other business? There being none, uh, appointments to boards and commissions. Other than uh, we're all in need of volunteers, please check our website to see if there's something that interests you and uh, sign up to help your community. With that, there being no further business before this board, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night, y'all.